Even if those who are born as human beings do not care about the study of the Vedas as well as the inanimate sciences, those inanimate objects only carry the burden of falsehood. If they have to endure so much grief pain and disability with a single stupid body, they themselves do not know why they are carrying so many stupid bodies in vain, says Yogi Rupnathji, when he is addressing all the world community. Yogi Rupnathji said, in Bhagavad Gita, the Almighty Lord Krishna declared that, Devote your heart, mind, religious sacrifices and prayers to me for eternity O path, and you shall, without fail, become a part of me forever. This is my promise to you, my devotee. Detach yourself from all worldly things O Arjuna, and reach out to me for your salvation and liberation from this world. I shall always protect you from all the worldly sins you may encounter. Put your full love, trust, and devotion in me and you shall fear nothing. I think these sacred dialogues will be very enlightening and preaches the supreme knowledge of Advak. Yogi Rupnathji explains the meaning of Atma, Self, from Puranas. Atma is that which pervades, the universe, takes back, the universe at the time of dissolution, enjoys, as the illuminator or experiencer of, objects here, in the world and has eternal existence. Yogi Rupnath say, according to me, the spiritual yoga is the only means of attaining the supreme good for all mankind where there is a total cessation of both sorrow and joy. I shall expound to you that yoga, with all its aspects, which was earlier taught to rishis who were eager to listen. It is considered by me that it is the mind, indeed, that is the cause for bondage and liberation of the self. For spiritual seekers, for attaining the reality, there is no path as auspicious as devotion, which unites one to the Lord who is the self of all beings. Extreme attachment, to the world, is an unbreakable rope for the self. Say learned men. The same when done for noble men, opens the gateway to liberation. Peaceful men of forbearance and compassion, without enemies, and the well-wishers of all beings, are the best among all noble people. Various worldly afflictions do not trouble those who practice firm devotion in me, with an unwavering mind, having given up all actions, relations, and friends for my sake, who depend on me alone, who listen and tell my sweet stories, and whose mind is absorbed in me. You should seek the company of those noble souls who are free of all attachments as they remove all your worldly attachments. Devotion is the single-pointed natural flow of thoughts along with senses by the gunas and actions understood by the scriptures, towards the Lord who is purity itself. It is costless, pertaining to the Lord, superior to all siddhis and destroys the covering of ignorance just as fire swallows all that is put in it. Devotion reveled. Some devotees do not desire to become one with me. They revel in serving my feet and doing activities for me. They assemble together and enjoy my work. Advak devotees never perish. Those for whom I am the Supreme Beloved, the Self, Son, Friend, Guru, Well-Wisher, and Dear Lord, Ayesta Deva, and who meditate on my peaceful form, never perish as unwinking time has no power over them. Jiva is renounced. I take such devotees across death who, having renounced all others, this world, the other world, the jivahood that goes from this world to the other, the body, and all that relates to it like prosperity, animals, and houses, worship me alone of universal form with single-pointed devotion. I shall now explicitly expound to you the differentiating characteristics of various entities, knowing which man becomes free of various entities, knowing which a man becomes free from the qualities of prakriti. I shall describe to you that knowledge about which great sages speak which is the means to the supreme good of man, which gives self-knowledge and cuts the knots of the heart. Pulusa was attributeless before creation. Before creation, the Pulusa was the beginningless self, attributeless, beyond prakriti, the very subject and self-shining, and even now it alone pervades the world. Pulusa manifested as prakriti. Brahman getting deluded. The same infinite lord, by chance alone, in sport, became manifested as the subtle Prakriti with qualities. Prakriti with its qualities creates a variety of being like itself. The Lord or Self having seen the creation got, as it were, 
completely diluted through the wailing of knowledge. Thus, by brooding over the other, Prakriti, man assumes doership of actions that are actually done by the qualities of Prakriti. About cause of bondage of Sansara, Yogi Rupnathji says, that doership causes bondage of samsara and enslaves this non-doer, witness, and peaceful self, the Lord. The great sages know that Prakriti is the cause of the cause-effect relationship and the notion of doership, and Purusa which is beyond Prakriti is the cause of the enjoyment of joy and sorrow. Purusa does not get affected by Prakriti. The Purusa, even though dwelling in Prakriti, does not get affected by the qualities of Prakriti, as he is immutable, non-doer, and attributeless like the sun in water. When the Purusa gets overwhelmingly attached to the qualities of Prakriti and gets deluded by the notion of doing, he then considers, I am the doer. Because of this attachment and doership, he helplessly reaches the state of a samsari and becomes unhappy. Due to the evil of action born of attachment, he is born in good, bad and middling wombs. Objects do not exist in reality because, indeed, even though objects do not exist really, the samsara does not seem to end. Just as one who broads on objects meets with disaster alone, even in the dream. Therefore, the mind which is extremely attached to rowing ways should be slowly brought under control by intense practice of devotion and dispassion. The bondage of Purusa by Prakriti is burnt up by spiritual practices performed day and night by Prakriti, body-mind, itself, like the fuel by the fire in the cup of the Arani. The practices are costless, choiceless, performance of one's duties, purity of mind, intense devotion to me, nourished by constant listening, knowledge with clear vision of truth, strong dispassion, intense meditation accompanied by austerity, and absorption of the mind. Jiva does not get deluded when that Prakriti which has been completely enjoyed, then discarded, whose evil effects are seen constantly, can cause no harm to one who abides in the glory of one's own self. The this statement is explained further with the help of example. Just as a dream causes a lot of sorrow to one who has not awakened, but the same does not delude one who has woken up. A person when asleep dreams and takes a role where he enjoys, suffers but on awakening, he realizes that everything was illusion and not a reality. Further Yogi Rupnathji says, in the same way, Prakriti never harms him who knows the truth and who revels in the self, as his mind is always united with me. Earlier, it was said that Purusa was formless and attributeless, without qualities, prior to creation. Our journey too is to go back to this state where there is no one else other than self. O oh friends, when the mind of the accomplished one does not get attached to the powers gained by the intense practice of yoga, for which, powers, there is no other cause, then one gains my absolute state where there is no laughter of death. This knowledge should not be taught to the wicked, the arrogant, the stubborn, the one with bad conduct, a hypocrite, an indulgent one one whose mind is obsessed with home, one who is not devoted to me and also one who dislikes my or absolute soul devotees. This knowledge should be given to one with faith, devotion, humility, who is uncarping, a friend of all, revels in serving all, dispassionate, peaceful free of envy, pure, and to whom I am the dearest of all. O oh my loving friends, by abiding in this easy to practice path, revealed by me to you, you shall are long reach the supreme goal. Have faith in this teaching of mine which is worshipped by the seekers or knowers of Brahmavidya. You shall reach my unborn state by it. Those who do not know it reach death. Due to the elimination of jivahood, and the mind firmly abiding in its reality, the Lord, who is the support of all jivas, her allegations were destroyed and she attained total peace. As her mind remained absorbed in the truth, she transcended the delusion of the qualities of Prakriti and, at that time, did not even remember her body like the one who awakes, does not remember, objects seen in the dream. Yogis are not aware of her physical body. That body, nourished by others was not even emaciated due to absence of mental afflictions. It is covered with dirt like fire with smoke. His mind absorbed in Vasudeva, Yogi, is totally unaware of his or her own body which was transformed by austerity and yoga, 
and protected by God, he or she seat with hair open, unconscious even of her clothes. Yogi Rupnathji says, O oh my friends, when the mind of the Siddha, the emancipated sage, is not attached to the miraculous powers born of yoga and obtained through yogic practice, then only is attained the ultimate state pertaining to me, a state where even the they cannot laugh, is powerless. O oh friends, I shall explain to you the nature of the Sabijya type of yoga, by practicing which only, the mind becomes tranquil and pure, and goes to the path, leading, to Brahmana. Performance of one's religious duties according to one's capacity, aversion to a religion, contentment in what one obtains by the Lord's grace, or one's fate. Worshipping the feet of those who have realized the soul, Atman. Abstention from duties pertaining to them, Earth and the first three common goals in life, devoted to duties leading to moke, liberation, eating pure food in moderation and permanent stay in a safe, secluded place. Non-violence, truthfulness, non-stealing, acceptance of only the bare necessities of life, celibacy, penance, purity, study of Vedas or Sastras, ritualistic worship of the Supreme Man. Silence, ever firmness in bodily posture and steady nag, gradual control of breath, mental withdrawal of sense from their objects into the heart. Concentration of the mind and the breath in one of the plexuses, like the Muladhara Kakra, constant meditation of the Leelas, sports, actions, of Lord, and concentration of the mind on God. By these and other means, such as observance of woes, giving donations, one should attain control over his breath, and deliberately and without slackness, direct the mind to the right path, mind which has become polluted by going to the path of worldly enjoyment. Having firmly fixed his seat in a clean holy place, he should, firstly, get, thorough, control of his posture. He should comfortably 81 I be seated on that seat, and keeping his body erect, he should practice, breath control. He should purify the passage, path, of the breath, the respiratory system, by systematic inhalation, retention and exhalation of breath or vice versa so that the mind becomes quiescent and steady. The mind of a yogin who has mastered his breathing, becomes pure immediately just as gold melt by the blast of wind and fire, gives up the dross mixed with it, one should burn one's impure humids in the body by the sins by the attachment objects of senses by prayura and undivine quality by meditation. When one's mind become pure and properly steady this is practically by Tayaga, one should meditate on the form of the Suprakme Lord, with his eyes fixed at the farthest end of his nose. Yogi Rupnathji says, O oh my friends, the Yogian should meditate on the complete form of God, till his mind is completely fired on God whose lotus-like face is kindly, that is gracious, whose eyes are reddish like the interior of a lotus, whose is dark blue like the petals of a blue lotus, who is holding, in his hands, a conch, a disc, sudha sanachakra, and a make, komoki gada, whose silk garments are yellow like the bright, shining, filaments of a lotus, whose chest bears the mark of Srivaksa, who wears the resplendent jewel hostuba around his neck, who is by a vanama about which intoxicated bees are humming sweetly, who is adorned with invaluable necklace, bracelets, crown, armlets, aigda, and anklets, whose waist, lit hip, is engirded by a lustrous belt, whose eat is in the lotus-like hero, of his devotees, who is the most beautiful, serene, delighting the eyes and caminds, of eyes devotees, who is charming to look, who is bold, and by all the worlds who appears like a boy, of fifteen, in age who is eagerly absorbed in, showering, grace on his servants whose holy fame to be equalized who has enhanced the fame of Bali and other lokas, persons of hallowed name. With his mind full of pure devotion, he should contemplate the God as standing, walking, sitting, lying, or occupying his heart, Lord who it us are worth looking. When the sage finds that his mind conciated on all the members of the of the Lord as a whole, he should try to fix on the malbas, of the body of the Lord, one by one. He should reflect, contate, the feet of the Lord which are enriched by the, 
lines showing Mahabhata Vajra, the Goad, Ikvasa, the Banda, Deba, and the Lotus, and the lunar rays emanating from Wu group of reddish, refulgent, toe, nails have dispelled Than's darkness in the hearts of his devotees. One should contemplate for a long time the Lotus. Feet of the Lord, feet, the waters washing which flowed forth and became a great river, the Ganga. God Shiva bore in sacred waters, of the Ganga, on his head and supremely auspicious. One should meditate man, those feet which are like a thunderbolt discharged against the mountain of evils, since, in the mind of the meditator, or the feet which detonate the Vajra, the mark on his feet, against the mountain of evils. One should contemplate in one's heart, the pair of the shanks and knees of the all-pervading Inadi who from samsara, the knees which are placed on her thighs and are gently served, pressed and massaged, with her brilliant sprout lake hands by luck dot me of lotus eyes, who the mother of God Brahma, the creator of all the worlds. One should meditate in one's e, the thighs of the Lord which appear superbly bent Garuda, and which are the source, or of strength, and are like a tasika, linseed, fleur in he should further contemplate be waist or round hip which are encircled, lit embraced, with the girdle which belts his yellow garment, pitamba, reaching his ukli. One should his deep look like navel on the stomach which is like a cave axiomoting all the worlds and from which sprouted forth the lotus which was the seat of Brahma and the of the universe. One should meditate on his pair of nipples which appear bright and weigh by the rays of the shining breaths of pearls. One should then contemplate in one heart. The chest of the great god, Hari, which is the resting place of his supreme power Mahalakshmi, and which brings great joy to men's minds and eyes. Then one hold remember, contemplate, the Lord's beloved make, Komoki, besmeared with the thick, mud lake, BLMD of inimical warriors. Mean one should contemplate, the garland, in his neck, which is, as if, resonant with the homing swarm of bees around it. He should, next, meditate on the spotless jewel Kaustuba which represents the essential principle of Tatta, beings. One should, then, properly the lotus lake face of the Lord who, with his mind full of compassion for his servant who, has assumed a form, incarnation, in this world, his face with shapely prominent nose and spotaheb illuminated by the of the indulgent earrings of shape. With close attention, one should contemplate is a mind the lotus-like face of hurry which manifests itself in the mind, face looking beautiful due to the locks of curly hair around it, and lotus-like eyes with taking charming eyebrows, and which thus surpasses in beauty the lotus abode of Lakshmi, which, due to his beauty is attended upon, hovered round, by black bee and resorted to by a pair of fish. With perfect and intense devotion one should confer a long time the glances of the eye of Hari who I dwelling in the cave in the form of one. Heart, glances, which are cast with great mercy and favor for soothing the terrible most afflictions of third type, Adhyatmika, Adhibhotika and Adhidevika, and which are accompanied with affectionate smile, and which confer abundance of grace devotees. One should then contemplate. Hari's most enchanting smile which drew up the sea of tears caused by the intense grief of all the people who bow to him. And I should meditate on, his circular eyebrows which he has backed by his maya to entice and delude the god of love for the sake of sage, whom he, the god of love, disturbs in them litter dawns. Vishnu manifests himself in the cave of the hurt in one's body. With the heart full of, lit must and with, devotion. One should contemplate on Vishnu loud lord as an object of meditation, laugh which exhibits his row of teeth like kunda buds, which appear reddish by the bright glow of his lower lip. Having dedicated one's mind to him, one should not desire to look anywhere else. In this way, of meditating on the lord, TLW Sage gets the love of Hari engendered in him. His heart is melted with devotion. He finds his hair standing on their ends through ecstatic joy. Due to the tears of joy flowing on account of his ardent love for God, he finds himself frequently submerged in the of joys. He or she gradually disentangles himself from his heart which is like a hook to secure the Lord. When the mind becomes unattached and withdrawn from the sense objects, it loses its support. To function as the meditator has no standing in the absence of the object of meditation.
it becomes dissolved in Brahman its being is transformed into Brahman, just as a flame in the absence of its support all, wick etc. becomes one with the Mahabhuta. Fire. In this stage, a man who is free from the flow of these that is the limitations of the body etc. at once realizes his soul directly as one. Without distinction such as the meditator and the object of meditation. Even he, the devotee or yogin, becomes dissolved in Brahman which is beyond pleasure and pain. In this last stage attained by the practice of yoga, his, yogin's, mind finally withdraws and becomes free from avidya. The yogin thus realizes the essential nature of the soul and transfers from himself the agency of the pleasure and the pain to ahankara. Ego, known as a suck which is the produce of avidya. Just as an addict, blind with the intoxication of wine, is not conscious of the existence of the garment he has own, the perfect siddha who has reached the final stage, this crib above, is not conscious whether his body is sitting or standing or is removed to another place or has returned by the will of the dittany, because he, the siddha, has reached, realized, his real self. So long as the kamyakama which is the cause of the body, is effective, and not exhausted, till that period the body along with the sense organs which is at the mercy of the fate does definitely exist. But he who has mastered the yoga up to the siddhi and who has realized the thing, that is the soul, do not again accept the body along with its identity as if it is an appearance in a dream. He becomes think and the contemplation of froms etc. Free from the ahankara regarding his body, his relative, belongings etc. Just as a man is found to be different from his son or wealth, even though they are accepted as his own, similarly the soul is distinct from his body, and things in association with it, though they are regarded as his self. Just as the, real, fire is different from the firebrand or from the sparks, emanating from it, or the smoke, issuing from it, or the burning wood is regarded as the fire, so also the seer is different and distinct from bhatas, sense organs and the mind, and takana. The Brahman is different from what is designated as Jiva, and the Lord, Supreme Soul, is different from Prakriti. Just as all types of beings, whether born from the womb or from the egg or from perspiration or germinating from seeds as plants, are identical from the point of their constitution from Mahabhutas, similarly one should see, the identity of, the soul, Atman, in all beings and of all beings in the Atman. Just as the fire, though one, appears to be different according to the difference in the quality of its source, that is the shape, size and quality of the wood burnt by it. Similarly the embodied soul appears different according to the difference in quality of its body, whether human, divine etc. Therefore, after conquering this incomprehensible Prakriti, God Vishnu's own power, which is of the form of cause and effect, sat and asata, one remains in one's own, original, pure, form. Yogi Rupnathji says, O oh my friends, the Bhakti Yuga, the path of Bhakti, and Yuga, of eight stage, have been explained to you by me. By following one of them, a man will attain to, the Supreme Man. This is the form of the Glorious Lord, the Supreme Soul, the Brahman. It is both Prakriti and Purusha, and still, is also beyond them. It is the unseen destiny, Deva, which is the cause of all karmas in the form of the divine form, of the Lord, which is the cause of the differences in the appearances of things, is called time. From it, fear is caused to beings, which entertain the notion of difference and which preside over the Mahat and others. He enters into all beings, Vathas, and supports all. He eats them up, annihilates them, by their means. He is called Vishnu, presiding deity of sacrifices who confers the fruit of the sacrifice, on the performer. He is the time, the ruler of rulers. Nobody is dear or inimical to him. He has no friend or relative. He is always alert and enters into the negligent people in order to destroy them. It is out of his, kalas, fear that the wind blows. It is due to his fear that the sun shines. God Indra showers, water, out of his fear. Heavenly body shine out of his dread. 
It is due to his fear that trees, creepers, plants and herbs blow em forth and bear fruits in the proper seasons. It is out of his fear that the rivers flow and the sea does not overflow his fixed limits. Being afraid of him, the fire burns and the earth, burdened, with mountains does not submerge, in the sea. It is due to his control that the sky affords space for living, breeding, Kritura and the principal Mahatapansa Iki body into the world enveloped in seven sheaths. He is endless but puts an end, to all. Time is beginningless but mark the beginning of all. He is immutable. He causes beings to be born of parents and causes the end of Antaka, god of death, by means of death. Yogi Rupnathji says, just as a row of clouds does not know the force of the mighty wind even though they are dispersed by it, similarly the people, though at the mercy of time, killer, certainly do not know the great prowess of the mighty time. Whatever object, of pleasure, a man acquires with great efforts for the enjoyment of pleasures, the omnipotent Lord destroys it, lit shakes it off, and the man grieves over it. For it is out of delusion that an ignorant person regards as permanent that which belongs to this perishable body and its relatives such as the house, lands, money, and other property, which are transitory. In whatever kind of existence, birth, a being is born in this samsara, he feels happy in that, particular, birth. He is never disgusted, and unattached, with it. The jiva is so deluded with the maya of God that even in hell, while he has to subsist on and find pleasure in the of hell, he verily does not desire to give up his, hellish, body. With his heart deeply in his body, wife, child, rain, house, atoll, wealth and relatives, he regards himself as fat and happy. All his body is as if burning with anxiety of supporting these. And, this ignorant person of evil intentions continuously goes on committing sins. His mind and senses are attracted by the spell of the seductive charms of unchaste women in privacy, and by the sweet indistinct wobbling of children. He is prompt and watchful in the householder's life which is characterized by unfair money dealings leading to a lot of misery. In such houses the householder regards it a pleasure to counteract the miseries. He maintains them with money, and loathe objects, acquired here and there, in various ways and from any place, with great injury, and trouble to all. He can enjoy, but little of, what is left after their consumption. By, thus, Maintaining them, he goes down, to hell. Just as miserly farmers neglect old, and hence useless, bulls, when his wife and others do not treat him with respect as before, as he has become incapable of maintaining them. Even in that stage he does not feel disgust. He is deformed with old age and is approaching death. He is attacked by disease. He eats but little due to loss of appetite. His movements slow down and he is now nourished by those whom he had brought up. He stays in the house like a dog eating what is contemptuously thrown to him. By the, vital, breath which is passing out, he has his eyeballs shot out. Flame chokes up the tubular passage, in his lungs. He suffers from extreme disturb in breathing due to cough and, and a gurgling sound is heard in his throat. He lies surrounded by his relative. He who is bound down with the news of death, does not reply, even though addressed, by his relatives. In this way, a man who has devoted himself completely for the maintenance of his family and has not controlled his sense organs, loses his consciousness. Then he sees two terrible looking messengers of death with eyes full of anger. They perforce shut him, the jiva, in a body specially designed to torture him. Fastening a noose round his neck, they drag him along the route, to the region of death, like the policemen, or king's men, do to convicts, persons to be punished. His heart is breaking with their threats. He is trembling, with fear. On the way, hellish dogs bite him. Remembering his sins, he feels distressed. He suffers from hunger and thirst. On the road covered with hot sand, he is scorched by the heat of the sun, forest conflagration and, hot, blasts of wind. He is severely whipped on the back. Though weak and exhausted, he drags, on the road, where there is neither shelter nor water. 
Now and then he faints exhausted. He rises again led by the most accursed dark path to the house of Yum, Hell. He is dragged within three or two mohotas on this road of 99,000 yujnas and undergoes the sufferings. His body is burned by surrounding it with firebrands. Sometimes he is made to eat his own flesh cut by himself or by others. While he is alive, his entrails are dragged out by the hounds or vultures in the hell. He is subjected to torments by the biting and stinging of serpents, scorpions, mosquitoes and others. His limbs are chopped off one by one. He is crushed by being trampled by the elephants and such other animals. He is thrown down from the tops of mountains. He is confined and suffocated in caves or under water. Whether a man or a woman, he or she undergoes tortures of the hells called Tamisra, under Tamisra, Rauva and others as a result of mutual illicit relations. O oh friends, some say that the heaven or the hell is here, in this world, only, because whatever tortures or afflictions are meted out in the hell are seen in this very world. In this way, he who maintains his family or earns his livelihood only, give up his family and his body, and appearances such kind of fruit for it after death in the other world. He who has collected only sins as the provision for a journey, in samsara, has to give up his physical body which he has maintained by doing wrong to other beings and goes alone to the hell of darkness hell. He becomes afflicted like a man who has been robbed of his wealth. The being, Jiva, who is eager to maintain his family by a religious behavior only, goes to the Andhatamisra hell, the lowest region of darkness. He regularly undergoes suffering and miserable types of births, of subhuman beings below, which he has passed through before his rebirth as a human being. He goes through them by degrees and becomes pure and is born as a human being. By his own karma, in one night, the mixture of the man's, semen and the woman's blood takes place. In five nights, a circular bubble-like mass is formed. In ten days, it becomes somewhat hard like the fruit of the juju tree, kakandu. Thereafter, it becomes a ball of flesh or an egg. In one month, the head is formed. In two months, the body develops arms, feet and other organs. In three months, nails, hair, bones, skin, the penis and the anus are formed. By the end of the fourth month, the seven essential ingredients of the body are produced. In the fifth month, hunger and thirst are felt. In the sixth more the fetus is enveloped with an external skin called Jarayu, and it begins to make movements in the right side of the mother's abdomen. He develops the essential ingredients of the body by the mother's intake of food and drinks. The jiva stays in an abominable hollow place, full of urine and feces, a breeding place of worms. By the frequent biting of the hungry worms which are prey, in the same hollow place, his whole body, being very delicate and soft, is wounded all over. Being extremely tormented, he falls into at every moment. He is affected by the bitter pungent, hot, salt, astringent, acidic and such other unbearable substances eaten by the mother, and thereby suffers pain spread all over the body. Enveloped in the womb and surrounded on the outside with the sea entrails, it lies there with his head protruding towards the stomach and with his back and neck in a bent position. Like a bird, shut up, in a cage, he is incapable of making, free, movements of his body there. As a result of his karma in previous births, he recollects his actions, karmas, done in the last hundred previous births and suffers the endless pain without a sigh. What happiness can he have in such a condition from the seventh month, he gets consciousness. But as he is always moved by the winds of delivery, Sitiveta, he cannot remain in one spot like the worms born in the feces in the same place. The jiva who knows both body and the soul but is bound by seven essential ingredients of the gross body, is afraid. In repentance he folds his hands and in words expressing distress, he praises the Lord who has confined him in the womb. The jiva, the individual soul, said, that the Lord has shown me this condition, made me to experience confinement in the womb, is quite befitting as I am wicked. I, who am of that type, now, 
Take shelter under the lotus lake feet of the Lord, who fearlessly moves over the earth, after assuming various bodies, incarnations, with the desire of protecting the world, which has submitted to him for refuge. I stay as if bound down, here, in the mother's womb, depending on the Maya in the form, of my body consisting, of five bhutas, sense organs and mind, manas, and with my real nature covered by kamas. I bow to the Lord who is being realized in my tormented heart yet is himself unaffected by changes, avikra, as he is extremely pure and unlimited by conditions, and of uninterrupted knowledge. I who am falsely concealed in a body composed of five bhutas, am factually unattached to it. I am the jiva falsely reflected in the sense organs, attributes, like sattva, and objects of senses. I bow to that supreme man whose greatness is not limited by the body. The supreme man who is the controller of the prakriti and puruya and who is omniscient. By what means can the jiva regain for himself his original status without the grace of the Lord by the power of whose maya he lost his memory about his true self and is wandering in this path of samsara suffering the afflictions resulting from it and wherein he incurs heavy bondage from actions committed due to the three gunas. Which of the gods except the supreme being has inspired in me this knowledge of the past, present and future? It must be the supreme god as, we jivas follow the course of karmas, and are subject to births and deaths. By his karma experiences, he has pervaded the mobiles and immobiles, as an antayamin. We resort to him for the cessation of the three kinds of afflictions, with adhibhotika, adhyatmika and adhidavika. O Lord! This embodied being has fallen into the hollow place full of blood, feces and urine in the cavity in the body of another person, that is the mother. His body is extremely scorched by the abdominal fire, of the mother. Being anxious of getting out of this place, he is counting his months. Takes the first half as the description of Paramatman. Paramatman, though concealed or covered by the body composed of five bhutas, is not at all touched by the defects or blemishes resulting from the contacts with the body. Highs the controller of both CIT and ASIC, sentient and non-sentient, for his body consists of gupas, objects of senses and the sentient principle, jiva. O omnipotent Lord, you are simply incomparable. By your unbounded mercy, you have blessed a jiva often months with this knowledge. May that protector of the distressed, that is you, be pleased with his, your, own action, of this gift of knowledge. What can anyone do to him, you, except offering one's obeisance? This another kind of jiva, subhuman beings like birds, beasts, certainly feels physical, pleasures and pains, pertaining to his body. I that is means unique Atman am blessed by him with intelligence, knowledge and discretion, and gifted by him with the body capable of being disciplined with satya, them etc. I can see that eternal, perfect Purasa directly both within and without my heart just like a Chaitanya, the Jiva who possesses Ahnakara and is an enjoyer of pleasure and pain. O all-pervading Lord, though I am dwelling in the womb full of many kinds of afflictions, I do not wish to get out of the womb and fall into a dark well, of ignorance, and be born in this world. Because, outside, God's Maya approaches the Jiva which has fallen into the dark pit, well, of Samsara. The Maya is followed by false apprehension, about the identification of the body and the soul etc., and this cycle of Samsara. I have now attained to the feet of Vishnu and am free from destruction. I shall stay therefore, here, in the womb, only with the help of my mind which is like a friend, I shall soon lift myself up from ignorance. So that the calamity of staying in many holes, wombs at the time of each birth in samsara, will not befall me. Yogi Rupnathji said, in this way, the jiva who is ten months old and who has acquired knowledge, makes up his mind. While he is praising the Lord in the womb the wine produced in the womb during the pangs of travail suddenly pushes him with his head downward for his birth. Being thus thrust down by the wind of delivery, the jiva gets suffocated and anguished and loses his memory. With great trouble, he is suddenly born with his head downward. He falls on the ground in a pool of blood and urine. 
he moves about like a worm in feces. Finding that, he has lost his knowledge and has fallen in the contrary state, of dark ignorance, he frequently cries out. He is being fed by persons who cannot understand the will, and need, of another. If he is presented an unwanted object, he is incapable of refusing it. He is made to lie down, sleep, on a dirty bed rendered troublesome by worms born of sweat. He is unable to scratch his limbs or make movements like silting, standing or moving. Just as big worms knock and bite smaller worms, similarly mosquitoes, flies, bugs etc. Bite the soft and delicate skin of the crying child who has lost its previous memory. In this way having suffered miseries in childhood and boyhood, in youth, he becomes downcast with grief for his inability to obtain the desired object. He flares up with rage out of ignorance. His pride and anger go on increasing with the growth of his body. He, being passionate, fights with other passionate persons like him, and meets his end, ruin. This ignorant, dull-witted embodied being constantly entertains the false notion about this body which is composed of five bhathas to be himself and as belonging to him. He performs action for the sake of the body, the body which gives the jiva a great trouble, from birth to death, and which being bound down by avidya, ignorance, and karmas, destiny, fruit of actions, always follows him, in the next birth. It is by being bound down to the body that the jiva goes to, and is entangled in, the cycle of samsara. While on the path of righteousness, if the being comes in contact with and is influenced by the unrighteous who are striving for the gratification of their lusts and appetites and enjoys himself, in those ways, he enters the darkness, of ignorance or hell, as before. For virtues such as, truthfulness, purity, mercy, silence, control over speech, intelligence or the sense of the highest objective, purusata, affluence, modesty, renown, forbearance, control of sense organs, control of the mind, prosperity go on diminishing in the company of the evil. One should not form association with those wicked persons who regard the soul as identical with the body and are devoid of serenity and are ignorant. They are under the influence of women like the domesticated deer with which the women play and hence pitiable. He is not that much affected by delusion and bondage on other occasion as when he is attached to women or to those who are attached to women. The Lord of creation, Brahma, was enamored of the beauty of his daughter when he saw her. When she assumed the form of a female deer, the shameless god assumed the form of a male deer and ran after her. With the exception of the sage Narayana who else? In this world, and out of the sages like Marasi created by Brahma and out of sages like Kartikeya and others born of them and among gods, human beings etc. created by, is not attracted by the Maya in the form of woman. Look at the power of my Maya in the form of the woman. By the mere movement of her eyebrow she tramples. Underfoot, conquers, the conquerors of the quarters the entire world. He who has attained self-realization by my service and desires to attain to the high, T stage of yoga, should never associate himself with women. For, they, yogins, call woman as the gate of hell. A woman is the Maya created by God. She slowly approaches you. You should look upon her as your death, like a deep pit covered by grass. Similarly a woman who wants liberation should regard as death the Maya who approaches her in the form of a man and who she thinks to be her husband. The woman is a jiva who, due to his attachment to women, in a former birth, has attained the form of a woman which procures for her, wealth, a house and children. Just as the song, sweet notes, of a hunter is a death to the deer, similarly one should understand the Maya to be the death in the form of the husband, children and home brought to her by fate. By his lingsarira surrounding the jiva, he wanders from one world to another, from one body to another. While the man enjoys the fruits of actions, he continuously goes on committing actions, kamas. The jiva that is the subtle body, lingsarira, closely follows the Atman and is conditioned by it. The gross body is THC product of the Bhutas, Indriyas, sense organs, and Manas, 
the mind. The suspension of the use of the gross body is the death, and the manifestation of its powers, to produce the effect, is the birth. When the gross body which is the place, and condition, of the perception of substances becomes incapable in its function of observing them, it is called death. When it, the gross body, is identified with the self through a hankara and is capable of perceiving the objects, it is called the birth. For example, when the eyes, the region of visual perception of objects, becomes incapable of seeing the parts of a substance, it is the incapability of the sensory organ. When the physical eyeballs and the sensory organ both cease to function, the seer the jiva that perceives becomes incapable of seeing. Thus the lingsarira, subtle body, becomes incapable of functioning after the incompetence and cessation of function of the gross body. But that is not the death of jiva, himself. As there is no birth or death to the jiva, the wise man should not get agitated with grief or show niggardliness, or be downcast with dejectedness in life, nor should get confused. He should understand the nature and the course of jiva and should move about, lead his life, without any attachment. By the power of his intellect capable of properly grasping the truth, and reinforced by the practice of yoga and non-attachment, he should place his body in this world created by Maya, that is he should give up attachment to his body, and go about the world. Yogi Rupnathji explains, for the creation of the sense of renunciation and to emphasize the distinctness of Atman from the body which is created and destroyed, the example of the organ of sight is taken. The physical eye is incapable of seeing the organ of sight and other objects. The organ of seeing is incapable to function when the eye is diseased, even though the object of seeing is present. When a person is absent-minded, he does not see the object though his physical eye and the sense of seeing are healthy and the object is present. Thus it is the intelligent seer, soul, who sees and he is distinct from the rest. So is the distinct dot shun between the soul and the body. The jiva is unattached to the body and things pertaining to it. The body of the jiva lives in this karma imi, the world created by the will of Narayuna. He should give up attachment, be unmoved like the deep, sane. He should have correct knowledge and faith. With his intellect strengthened by bhakti, yoga and varagya he should realize Narayana, the support of heaven, hell etc. Where jivas go? He should lead his life in the service, and meditation, of Narayana. Yogi Rupnathji said, Now, a person who sticks to domestic life and performs the religious duties prescribed for householders, obtains from them THC2 objectives, Kama, enjoyment of desired objects, and Urtha, wealth. He continues to perform the same duties again. He also is so much deluded with the objects of enjumkins, that he becomes averse to the Bhagavatam. Endowed with earnest faith, he continues to worship the gods and Pitras, ancestors, by performing sacrifices. The man has his mind completely possessed of faith, in gods and Pitras. He observes the religious woes, for the propitiation, of mains and gods, and drinks Soma juice, in the Soma sacrifice. Such a man will attain to the heaven presided over by the moon, but, will come back, that is will be born, again to this world. But, when Hari who is seated on Ananta, Saina, gods to sleep on the bed of that lord of serpents, at the time of Pilaya at the end of Brahma's day, those regions, accessible to such householders, are, also, dissolved. The wise persons who do not perform their religious duties for obtaining karma, their desired objects, and Urtha, wealth, who are unattached and have deposited, offered, all their religious acts, in God as his worship, who are extremely serene and of pure mind, who are engaged in the Nisratidam, who have given up the sense of mindness, ownership, and inus wise persons, by their power called observance of one's duties, swatham, and by thoroughly purified mind, go through the portals of the sun to the perfect, or omniscient, Puraza, the supreme man, who is the lord of the universe, of the movables and immovables, the liberated and the unliberated etc., 
and who is the material cause of the world, and who causes THC creation and the destruction of the universe. Those who meditate upon Hilvagava, Brahma, as the Supreme Being, stay in the Satya Lok, Brahma's region, to the end of the second Paradha which is she time of God Brahma's Pralya, the Mahaprayaya indicating the end of Brahma's period. When the great God Brahma enjoys his full span of life called Paradha, he desires to withdraw the universe composed of the gross elements, with the earth, water, fire, wind and the sky, the mind, the sense organs along with their objects and the Ahankara. He becomes one with the Prakriti composed of three Gupas and enters the unmanifest Brahman. The yogians who have controlled their breath and mind and are unattached to worldly objects reach along with Brahma, Hipyagava, to the immortal highest Brahman, the ancient Purasa. For till then, they have not yet shed of their ego, Ahankara, completely. O oh brilliant friends, you devoutly take shelter under him who is enshrined in the lotus lake hearts of all beings and whose glory you have heard from me, even God Brahma is born again. God Brahma, who bears the Vedas within him, is the first, that is the creator, of the movable and immovable world. Along while sages, like Marisi, great yogins like Sanath Kumara etc. And Siddhas who have propagated yoga path, even he having attained to the Sagulra Brahman, he, is born again as before at the time of the, next, creation when the balance of three Gupas gets disturbed and the gums get into commotion by the force of time, Kala, which is a form of the Lord. They, the sages etc., also, having enjoyed the divine glories and positions accrued to them by their religious acts, are born again when the universe is created, lots of gunas get mixed up at the time of creation. Those whose minds are attached here to karmas, perform with faith all the daily religious duties as well as those, kamya, actions which are not prohibited by the Dharm Sastra. Those whose mind has become dull by rugupa, and is attached to enjoyments, have no control over senses. Their heart finds pleasure in domestic life. These, persons, propitiate the pits, ancestors. Those who value only the first three objectives in life, wisdom, artha and karma, set their face against the stories of Hari, the vanquisher of demon Madhu, whose great prowess is worth eulogizing and memory about whom eliminates the samsara. They are certainly of accursed fate who leaving aside the Nta-like stories of Hari, Listen to the wild accounts just as fees eating animals feed upon excrement, ledge, power etc. And is Sagupa as the creator of the universe. He assumes human form for his devotees. Hence he is called Pertka. They go to the region of pits, ancestors, through the southern path of Aryaman, technically called Dhamramaga, path of smoke. Those who perform all the prescribed religious rites from the pregnancy, Gavadana, to the funeral, are born in their own family, lit of their descendants. O pious friends, thereafter when their merit, accrued to them by their religious acts, is exhausted, they are immediately deprived of their means of, celestial, enjoyments by gods. They being helpless, at the mercy of their karmas, fall again to this world. Therefore you adore the Supreme Lord, Vishnu, with utmost regard and devotion based on, that is felt on account of contemplation of, his excellent attributes. The lotus lake feet of the Lord deserve service. If the yoga called devotion to Lord Vasudeva is intensely practiced, it immediately generates desirelessness and knowledge that leads to the realization of Brahman. As a matter of fact, all objects are equal. But it is when the mind of the devotee becomes fixed and steady in God due to the votary's love for the excellent attributes of the Lord that it does not discriminate, between them, according to the attitude of the senses, as being favorite and agreeable and non-favorite and disagreeable. At that time, in that stage, he realizes the Brahman by his own self as being free from all attachment, of perfect wisdom. Free from acceptability or rejectability, that is above merits and demerits, and full of the highest bliss. The para-brahman is pure knowledge conscious it is described as the supreme Atman, the Rivara and Nes the Purasa. The Lord, Bhagavan, is the same who is equally perceived in different capacities, as the seer, the thing to be seen and the act of seeing. 
perfect non-attachment to the world in all respects is the only desired fruit that a yogin is to get by practicing all yogas in this world. The Brahman is one, without a second. It is of the nature of knowledge or consciousness and without any attributes. It is an illusion when through outward looking sense organs it appears as things, like the sky, of sound and other attributes. Just as Theonemahat, Tava, appears as a hankara of three types, with Sakvika, Rajsa and Umasa, and of five kinds, according to the five Mahabhutas, and eleven kinds, as per ten sense organs plus the internal organ, with the mind, it is from the same principle that the Devaraj, Jiva, its body and its egg, of the universe, make their appearance. Verily it is only a non-attached person whose mind is composed and serene by faith, devotion and continuous practice of yoga who realizes this Brahman. Oh dear friends, I have up till now explained to you the knowledge that leads to the realization of the Brahman. It is by this knowledge that the real nature of Prakriti and Purasa is clearly understood. The path of knowledge, Gayana Yuga, pertains to the attributeless Brahman while the Yuga called Bhakti, devotion, is based on firm devotion to me. But both of them have the same objective with the realization of the Supreme Lord. Just as the same object possessing many attributes is perceived in different forms by the sense organs with separate functions, lit similarly, the Supreme Lord, though absolutely one without a second, is seen in different ways through different fastras. By doing religious acts, by performing sacrifices, by donating gifts, by penance, by the study of the Vedas, by subduing the Atman and the sense organs and by renunciation of Kamas. By means of the Yuga with, eight, different stages, and by the path of Bhakti, Bhakti Yuga, by religious practices both with and without the desire for their fruits, which are called Pravati and Nivati. By clear knowledge about the nature of the soul and by firm sense of non-attachment, by means of these, the self-illuminating Lord whether Saguna or Nirguna is realized. I have clearly described to you the nature of the four kinds of Bhakti Yuga and of Kila, time, whose course is unmanifested but which runs within the beings, to bring about their birth and death. I have narrated to all of you, the courses of Jiva, which are created by Avidya and Kama. O oh friends, when the soul enters into these, he does not know its own real nature. This knowledge should not be explained to the evil person nor to one of undisciplined, arrogant, nature, nor to a dullard nor to a man of bad character, nor to a hypocrite. One should not advise this to a person of greedy nature, nor to a person whose mind is attached to his house, property etc., nor to one who is not devoted to me. It should never be taught to the enemies of my devotees. It should be taught to my faithful devotee, who is modest and disciplined and is not jealous of anybody. To one who has formed friendship with beings, and who takes pleasure in serving, his elderly persons or preceptor. It should expound it to him who is completely unattached internally and externally, who is of tranquil heart, and is not envious of anybody, is pure and to whom I am the dearest of the dear. O oh friends, the man who even once hears this knowledge with faith, or relates this to others with his mind set on me verily attains to my abode soul, the Brahman, the glorious Lord. The stage called Nirvoya. The place called Siddhapada where yogi or yoginis attained the liberation became famous as the holiest place in the three worlds. His or her mortal body from which impurities are eliminated by yoga, is transformed into a river, a prominent one among many rivers. It blesses one with Siddhas and is resorted to by Siddhas. He who listens to this doctrine of the sages regarding the knowledge about the Atman, becomes able to concentrate his mind upon the venerable Lord whose banner has the of Garuda, and he attains to the lotus-like feet of the glorious Lord. Yogi Rupnathji then said, O oh friends, the Lord of creation, who is present in the shoreless waters, on the earth and above the heaven and who is greater than the great, having entered the shining intelligences of creatures in seed form, acts in the fetus, which grows into the living being that is born. That in which all this universe exists together and into which it dissolves, that in which all the gods remain enjoying their respective powers, that certainly is whatever that has been in the past and whatever indeed is to come in the future. 
This cause of the universe, Prajpati, is supported by his own imperishable nature described as absolute ether. He by whom the space between heaven and earth as well as the heaven and the earth are enveloped, he by whom the sun burns with heat and gives light, and he whom the sages bind in the ether of their hearts, with the string of meditation, in whom, the imperishable one. All creatures abide. From whom the creatrix of the world, Prakti, was born, who created in the world creatures out of elements such as water, who entered beings consisting of herbs, quadrupeds and men as the inner controller, who is greater than the greatest, who is one without a second, who is imperceptible, who is of unlimited forms, who is the universe, who is ancient, who remains beyond darkness or prakti and who is higher than the highest, nothing else exists other than, or subtler than, him. Yogi Rupnathji then says, Sages declare, that alone is right and that alone is true that alone is the venerable Brahman contemplated by the wise. Acts of worship and social utility also are that reality. That alone being the navel of the universe, sustains manifold the universe which arose in the past and which springs to existence at present. That alone is fire, that is air, that is sun, that verily is moon, that alone is shining stars and ambrosia. That is food. That is water and he is the lord of creatures. All Naimiyas, Kals, Mhotas, Kavit Macron Havit Macrones, Days, Half Months, Months, and Seasons, were born from the self-luminous person. The year also was born from him. He milked water and also these two, the firmament and the heaven. No person ever grasped by his understanding the upward limit of this Parampman, nor his limit across, nor his middle portion. His name is Great Glory. For no one limits his nature by definition. His form is not to be beheld, none whosoever beholds him with the eye. Those who meditate on him with their minds on these tracks and fixed in the heart know him. They become immortal. This self-luminous Lord renowned in the scriptures pervades all the quarters of heaven. Having been born as Hiryagava in the beginning, he indeed is inside the universe represented as the womb. He alone is the manifold world of creation now springing into existence and causing the birth of the world of creation yet to come. As one having face everywhere, he dwells also as the innermost self leading all creatures. The self-luminous reality is one without a second and is the creator of heaven and earth, having created the universe by himself and out of himself, he became the possessor of the eyes, faces, hands and feet of all creatures in every part of the universe. He controls all of them by them and other them, merit and demerit, represented as his two hands and the constituent elements of the universe which have supplied the souls with the material embodiment represented as patatra or legs. Yogi Rupnathji then said, O oh friends, he in whom this universe originates and into whom it is absorbed, he who exists as the warp and woof in all created beings, he by whom the three states, of waking, dream and deep sleep, are appointed in the intellects hidden in creatures, he in whom the universe finds a single place of rest, having seen that Parampman, the Gandhav named Vena became a true knower of all the worlds and proclaimed, to his disciples for the first time, that reality as immortal. He who knows that all pervasive one becomes worthy of receiving the honor due to a father even from his own natural father through whose power the gods who have attained immortality in the third region of heaven got allotted their respective places, he is our friend, father and ordainer. He knows the proper places of each because he understands all created beings. They, that is, those who have realized their identity with the highest lord, immediately spread over heaven and earth. They pervade other worlds, the quarters of heaven and the heavenly region called Suvaloka. Whosoever among created beings sees that Brahman named Ritao, the true, unintermittently pervading the creation like the thread of a cloth, by contemplation in mind, truly becomes that. Having pervaded the worlds and the created beings and all the quarters and intermediate quarters, the firstborn of Brahman known as Prajpati or Hiryagava became by his own nature as Parampman, the ruler and protector of individual souls. I pray I may attain to the marvelously excellent Lord of the unmanifest cause of the universe who is dear to Indra and my own self, who is covetable, 
who is worthy of reverence and who is the bestower of intellectual powers. Yogi Rupnath Ji then said, Vedas prayer to absolute soul, says. Ojha Vedas, shine brilliantly in order to destroy the sins connected with me. Confer on me enjoyments of various kinds including cattle. Give me sustenance and longevity and appoint a suitable dwelling for me in any direction. Ojha Vedas, through thy grace may not the evil one slay our cows, horses, men and other belongings in the world. O fire, come to succor us without holding weapons in thy hand or thoughts of our offenses in thy mind. Unite me on all sides with wealth. May we know the Supreme Person and for the attainment of his knowledge may we meditate upon him, the thousand-eyed great God. May Rudra, the giver of knowledge, impel us towards such meditation and keep us in it. Yogi Rupnath Ji says, Vedas prayer him says to him. May we know or realize the Supreme Person. For that, may we meditate upon Mahadeva and to that meditation may Rudra impel us. May we know the Supreme Person. For that, may we meditate upon Vakratuna may Dantin impel us towards it. May we know the Divine Person. For that, may we meditate upon Kakratuna may Nandi impel us towards it. May we know that Divine Person. For that, may we meditate upon Mahasena. May Amuha impel us towards it. May we know that Divine Person for that, may we meditate on Suvraka. May Goruya impel us towards it. May we know the Veda, embodied as the four-faced Brahm. For that, may we meditate upon Hiryagava. May Brahman impel us towards it. May we know Nraya. For that, may we meditate upon Vsudev. May we impel us towards it. May we know Vajranaka. For that, may we meditate upon Tkadama. May Nasimha impel us towards it. May we know Bhaskara. For that may we meditate upon the great light producer. May Dikya impel us towards it. May we know Vivnara. For that, may we meditate upon La. May Agni impel us towards it. May we know Katyana. For that, May we meditate upon Kekumri. May Dog impel us towards it. May Doba, the panic grass, who represents the divine spirit, who is superior to a thousand purifying agencies, who has innumerable nodes and sprouts and who destroys the effects of evil dreams, remove all my impurities. O Doba, just as thou growest farther and farther multiplying at every node putting forth roots and fresh stalks, so also help us to grow in progeny by hundreds and thousands, Yogi Rupnath Ji then said, Prayer to says. O Devi, worshipped by devotees, may we worship thee with oblations. Thou who multipliest thyself by hundreds and growest in thousands. O earth that is traversed by a horse, a chariot and wheel, I shall keep thee on my head, protect me at every step. The earth is the giver of happiness like the milk cow, the sustainer of life and support for all living beings. Represented as such the earth is addressed, thou wert raised up by Ka in his incarnation of the bow having hundred hands. O excellent earth, destroy my evil deeds as well as sins connected with me. O excellent earth, thou art a gift from God to creatures. Thou art prayed over by Kasyapa. O excellent earth, grant me prosperity, for everything depends on thee. O excellent earth, on which all creatures are supported, cleanse all that, sin, from me. O excellent earth, my sins having been destroyed by thee, I attain to the highest goal. Yogi Rupnath Ji then said, Vedas prayer also, says. O Indra, make us fearless of those, causes such as sin, enemies and hell, of which we are afraid. O Madhvan, destroy that, that is the cause of fear, that is in us, thy devotees. For our protection destroy our harassing enemies. May Indra come to our succor, Indra who is the giver of welfare on earth and bliss in the next world, who is the lord of people, who is the slayer of Vtra, who is the subduer of enemies and giver of rain, who is peaceable and giver of safety. May Indra who is profusely praised by the devotees through sacred hymns, or frequently worshipped with oblations, vouchsafe to us safety and well-being. May the all-knowing or all-possessing Pan vouchsafe to us well-being. May Garuda, the son of Tka, whose chariot is not injured by anyone, 
vouchsafe to us safety. May Vaspati, the preceptor of gods, grant us well-being. Soma who is of mild anger, who strikes with stones, who shakes enemies, who has many deeds, who wields weapons and who delights in Soma juice kept over, causes the jungles of dried up trees and bushes, to grow by the downpour of rains. Counterweights do not weigh down making Indra light. Vena, the noon sun who was born at the beginning of creation as the first effect of the supreme reality, Brahman, and who is of excellent brilliance, spreads over the whole world up to its boundary. He illumines also the heavenly bodies. He remains manifold in his own limited forms which are like himself. He also spreads over and permeates the casual substance out of which the visible and the invisible universe emerges. Being the producer of creatures include ing men and their settler in respective regions and also far famed for forbearance, O earth, be to us an ender of sorrows and giver of bliss here and hereafter. I invoke in this act of worship are, the support of all, who is known through smell, who is unassailable, perpetually prosperous, rich in Kaudung and the mistress of all created beings. May Shri favor me. As Atman. May Alakmi connected with me and mine be destroyed. The gods having Vishnu for their chief, who is the perpetual abode of Shri, by the help of, the means prescribed in, the Vedas won these worlds for themselves free from the fear of enemies. May Indra, armed with thunderbolt and worshipful moon, grant us happiness. May Indra grant us welfare. May he destroy the evil one hostile to us. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Veda's prayer says to him, O Lord of prayers, make me the presser of Soma Jews, well known among the gods like Kaksivan, the son of Osik. Make me physically capable of performing sacrifices. Let those who are hostile to us remain. There. Long, in the hell. He who is rendered holy by the ancient, widespread, sanctifying feet, or by virtuous conduct, crosses over evil deeds and their effects. Having been rendered holy by that naturally pure and purifying feet of the Lord, or conduct, may we overcome our enemies, the sins. O Indra, O Slayer of Dhra, O Valorous One and All-Knowing One, accept with pleasure our Soma oblations in the company of your retinue and troop of gods. Slay our enemies, give us victory in battle and grant us safety and fearlessness from every quarter. For us may, the regents of, Water and herbs be friendly and to those who dislike us and whom we dislike let them be unfriendly. O waters, verily you are bliss conferring. Being such, grant us food, and great and beautiful insight, of the supreme truth. Further, make us in this very life participators of that joy of yours which is most auspicious, just like fond mothers, who nurse their darlings with nourishment. May we attain to that satisfactory abode of yours which you are pleased to grant us. Generate for us also the waters of life and pleasures on earth, during our sojourn here. I take refuge in Varuya, who is of golden luster or who has a golden diadem. O Varuya, being entreated by me, grant me the saving grace. For I have enjoyed what belongs to bad people and accepted gift from sinners. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Veda's prayer says. May Indra, Varuna, Brihaspati and Savitri completely destroy that sin committed by me and my people in thought, word and act. Salutation to fire hidden in water. Salutation to Indra. Salutation to Varuya. Salutation to Vru, the consort of Varuya. Salutation to the deities of waters. Through the power of this mantra, let all that is injurious, impure and troublesome in water be destroyed. May the king Varuna efface by his hand whatever sin I have incurred by unlawful eating, unlawful drinking and accepting gifts from an unlawful person. Thus being sinless, stainless and unbound by evil and bondage, may I ascend to the happy heaven and enjoy equality of status with Brahman. May the sin-effacing Varuya who dwells in other sources of water like rivers, tanks and wells also purify us. O Ganga, O Yamuna, O Saraswati, O Sutadri, O Marudhrida, O Ajikya, come together and listen to this hymn of mine along with Parusne, Asini, Vitasta and Susoma. Then Yogi Rupnathji says, From the all-illuminating supreme, 
by his resolve, the right and the true were generated. From him night and day were generated. And from him again was generated the sea with different waters. Then, after the creation of the vast ocean the year was generated. Afterwards the ruler of the world of sentient and non-sentient beings who made day and night, ordained sun and moon, sky and earth and the atmosphere and blissful heaven, just as they were in the previous cycles of creation. May the sinifacing Varuya, the deity presiding over the waters, purify the taint of sin that attaches to the beings dwelling on the earth, in the atmospheric region and in the space between the earth and heaven and also connected with us. The performers of religious work. May the Vsas purify us. May Varuya purify us. May Gamra, the sage called by that name, purify us. He, Varuya, is the protector of the world that was and also the world that exists at present between the past and the future worlds. He grants to the doers of meritorious deeds the worlds which they deserve and to the sinful the world of death called Hilmaya. Again Varuya who is the support of heaven and earth, having become the sun is wholesome and attractive. Being such, blissful in nature, thou O Varuya, grant us thy favors and purify us. Yogi Rupnathji says then, that supreme light which projected itself as the universe like a soaked seed which sprouts or that supreme light which shines as the substratum of the liquid element. I am that supreme light, I am that supreme light of Brahman which shines as the inmost essence of all that exists. In reality I am the same infinite Brahman even when I am experiencing myself as a finite self, owing to ignorance. Now by the onset of knowledge I am really that Brahman which is my eternal nature. Therefore I realize this identity by making myself, the finite self, an oblation into the fire of the infinite Brahman, which I am always. May this oblation be well made. He who is a transgressor of the scriptural conduct, a recreant, a thief, a feticide or an outrager of his preceptor's honor is released from his sins, for Varuya, the regent of waters and effacer of sins, absolves them from sins by the repetition of this mantra. I am the ground of sins. Therefore you cause me to weep. Wise men say. Don't make me weep, but favor me by destroying my sins. Yogi Rupnathji then said, O oh friends, Veda's prayer says, The Supreme, represented as the ocean, has overflown to the whole creation. He has created at first creatures according to the deserts of their various past deeds. He is the ruler of the universe and the munificent giver of gifts to the devotees he dwells together with them, his power giving spiritual illumination, in the hearts of devotees which are holier than other parts of their body, the seat of the divine, and therefore superior and elevated like a peak and affording protection the jiva who is his abode grows to be infinite. He is the Lord who delights the individual souls by guiding according to their deeds and conferring on them fruits of their actions. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Veda's prayer says, May we offer oblations of Soma to Jatavedas. May the All-Knowing One destroy what is unfriendly to us. May He, the divine fire that leads all, protect us by taking us across all perils even as a captain takes the boat across the sea. May He also save us from all wrongs. I take refuge in her, the goddess Dorg, who is fiery in luster and radiant with ardency, who is the power belonging to the Supreme, who manifests himself manifold, who is the power residing in actions and their fruits rendering them efficacious or the power that is supplicated to by the devotees for the fruition of their work. O thou goddess skilled in saving, thou takest us across difficulties excellently well. Our salutations to thee. O fire, thou art worthy of praise. With happy methods take us beyond all difficulties. May our hometown and homeland become extensive and may the plot of earth, for growing the crops, also be ample. Further, be thou pleased to join our children and their children with joy. O Jhavedas, thou who art the destroyer of all sins, take us beyond all troubles and protect us just as one is taken across the sea by a boat. O fire, guard our bodies and be mindful of its safety, like the sage Akri who always repeats mentally. May everyone be whole and happy. We invoke from the highest place of assembly the fire god who is the leader of all, who is the charger and vanquisher of the hosts of enemies, 
and who is fierce. May he, the fire god take us across all our difficulties and wrongs and all that is perishable, and protect us. Thou, who art lauded in sacrifices, increase our happiness. Thou abidest in the form of sacrifices, ancient and recent, in the places of sacrifice. O fire, be thou pleased to make, us, happy, who are, thine own selves. Further, grant us from all sides, good fortune. O Lord, thou art unconnected, with sin and sorrow, and thou pervadest, all sacrifices. Desirous of good fortune, comprising in cattle and overflowing, with the current of immortal bliss, may we serve thee without break. May the gods who dwell in the highest region of heaven delight me, practicing loving adoration, for view, here on the earth by granting my wish. May the deity, earth, grant me, food. For that I make oblation to fire and earth. Hell. May the deity of, atmosphere, grant me, food. For that I make oblation to air and atmosphere. Hell. May the deity of, heaven, grant me, food. For that I make oblation to the sun and heaven. Hell. May the deities of, earth, atmosphere and heaven, grant me, food. For that I make oblation to the moon and the quarters hell. Salutation to gods. Swad, reverence, to mains, may the deities of, earth, atmosphere and heaven, assent to my desire with the utterance of, Om, and grant me, food. Yogi Rupnathji said, Veda's prayer offer to argues like, Hail I offer this oblation to Brahman who is expressed by the first vyuhti, to fire created by him and to the earth dependent on him. Hail. I offer this oblation to Brahman who is expressed by the second vyuhti, to the air created by him and to the atmosphere dependent on him. Hail I offer this oblation to Brahman who is expressed by the third vyuhti, to the sun created by him and to heaven dependent on him. Hail. I offer this oblation to Brahman who is expressed by the Vyuktis, BH, Bhuva and Suva, to the moon created by him and to the quarters. Salutation to the gods dwelling in all the regions reverence to the departed ancestors I am that Brahman expressed by Om in unity and also expressed by the three Vyuktis in his threefold aspect. O divine fire, ascend to my prayer. Hail. I offer this oblation to the adorable supreme who is the all and to his parts the deities, who, fire and earth. Hail. I offer this oblation to the adorable supreme who is all and to his parts, bhuva, air and atmosphere. Hail. I offer this oblation to the adorable supreme who is all and to his parts, suva, the sun and heaven. Hail. I offer this oblation to the adorable supreme who is all and to his parts, bhuh, bhuva, suva, the moon the asterisms and the quarters. Salutation to gods. Reverence to mains. I am that supreme reality expressed by the syllable Om and the three Vyuktis, Vuh, Bhuva and Suva. May I attain the supreme. O fire, preserve us from sin. Hell. Preserve us so that we may attain full knowledge. Hell. O resplendent one, preserve our sacrificial acts. Hell. O Satakrathu, preserve everything, that belongs to us. Hail. O Divine Fire, O Settler of all creatures, being praised by the hymns of the first Veda, be gracious to protect us. Hail. Further, being praised by the hymns of the second Veda, be gracious to protect us. Hail. Being praised by the hymns of the third Veda, be gracious to protect our food and strengthening essence of it. Hail. Being praised by the hymns of the four Vedas, be gracious to protect us. Hail. Yogi Rupnathji then says to the listeners, The Supreme Being, Indra, who is the most excellent pranav taught in the Vedas, who ensouls the entire universe, who leads the collection of Vedic utterances in Gyakra and other mitas standing in their beginning, who is capable of being attained by the worshippers and who is the first in the casual link taught the contemplative sages the sacred wisdom of the Upanishad, himself being the subject matter of them, in order to strengthen them with the power of knowledge. I salute the gods for removing the obstacles in my path to illumination. 
for the same I also reverence the mains. The triple regions of Bhuvah, Bhuva and Suva and the entire Veda are comprised in Om. My salutations to the Supreme. May I concentrate my thoughts upon Him in order that I may be united with Him. May I become one practicing concentration of thought without distraction. I have heard enough with my ears and perceived pleasurable objects through other senses. O oh my senses, do not fail me now, but settle yourselves in the Supreme Brahman with whom I wish to unite myself through the meditation of Om. Right is austerity. Truth is austerity. Understanding of the scriptures is austerity. Subduing of one's senses is austerity. Restraint of the body through such means like fast is austerity. Cultivation of a peaceable disposition is austerity. Giving gifts without selfish motives is austerity. Worship is austerity. The Supreme Brahman has manifested himself as Bhu, Bhuva and Suva, meditate upon him, this is austerity par excellence. Just in the same manner as the fragrance of a tree in full blossom is wafted by the wind from a distant place, the fragrance of meritorious deeds, the good name that accrues from them, spreads to a great distance as far as heaven. There is again this illustration, Veda's prayer said, Yogi Rupnathji says, the cutting edge of a sword is laid across a pit. I am placing my feet on it, I am treading over it. So saying, if I walk over it, I will be perturbed by the thought of hurt or fall into the pit. In the same manner a man who is exposed to open and hidden sins must seek to guard himself from either in order that he may attain immortality. The infinite self more minute than the minute and greater than the great is set in the heart of the beings here. Through the grace of the Creator one realizes him who is free from desires based on values, who is supremely great and who is the highest ruler and master of all, and becomes free from sorrows. From him originate the seven pras, the seven flames, their fuel, the seven tons and the seven worlds in which the life breaths move. Further other things that are, sevenfold also come forth from him, who dwells in the secret place of the heart and are set in their respective places. From him arise all the seas and mountains. From him flow rivers of all kinds and from him all herbs and essences come forth. United with the essence of the herbs the individual soul seated in the subtle body dwells in creatures. The Supreme having become the four-faced Brahm among gods, the master of right words among the composers, the seer among the intelligent people, the buffalo among animals, the kite among the birds, the cutting axe among the destructive tools and soma among the sacrificers, transcends all purifying agencies accompanied by the sound of holy chant. There is one unborn female, Emavith Macron Vyavith Macron, the uncost substance of the universe, red, white and black, representing sakva, rajas and tamas, producing manifold offspring of the same nature. There is one unborn, in the generic sense some jwas who are attached, who lies by her taking delight in her. There is another unborn, in the generic sense those who are not attached, who leaves her after having enjoyed her. That which is the sun who abides in the clear sky, is the vasu, the air that moves, in the mid-region, is the fire that dwells in the sacrificial altar and in the domestic hearth as the guest, is the fire that shines in men and in the gods, as the soul, is the fire that is consecrated in the sacrifice, is dwelling in the sky as air, is born in water as submarine heat, is born in the rays of the sun, is the fire that is directly seen as the luminary, and is born on the mountain as the rising sun. That is the supreme truth, the reality underlying all. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Vedas says, the beings born from Prajpati are not separate from him. Before their birth nothing whatsoever existed other than him, who entered all the creatures of the world as their inmost self. Prajpati has identified himself with the creatures. He imparts the three luminaries, fire, sun and moon, luster by identifying himself with them. He is endowed with sixteen parts. We invoke the creator of the universe who sustains the creation in many ways and who witnesses the thoughts and deeds of men. May he grant us plenty of excellent wealth. The sacrificers poured clarified butter into the consecrated fire. Clarified butter is the place of origin of this one and in clarified butter is his support. 
Indeed clarified butter is his luminant and residence. O fire, with every offering of oblation bring here the gods and delight them. O thou excellent one, convey to gods the offerings we have made with salve. From the supreme fount, vast as the ocean, arose the universe in the shape of waves, yielding enjoyment to created beings. The name designating the self-luminous reality and consisting of the syllable Om is hidden in the Vedas. By contemplating on the Supreme along with the slow repetition of that name one attains to immortality. This designation of the Supreme is on the lips of contemplative sages and it is the central support of undying bliss. May we always repeat in our contemplative sacrifices the designation Om which has for its cause the self-luminous reality and may we also hold him in our hearts with salutations. Yogi Rupnath Jise, Vedas says, the four-horned white bull has expressed this supreme Brahman praised by us in the hearing of co-seekers. The syllable Om conceived as the bull possesses four horns, three feet and two heads. He has seven hands. This bull connected in a threefold manner, eloquently declares the supreme. The self-luminous deity has entered the mortals everywhere. Godlike sages attained in the order of their spiritual practices, the self-luminous reality, laid in the three states of consciousness and secretly held by the teachers who praise it by chance in the Vedic speech. The great formulas such as Thou art that Indra or Virat, the regent of the visible universe and the waking consciousness, created one, the visible world. Sraya representing Thaijasa and Hilyagava created one, namely, the world of dream, and from Vena came the Rimanayang one, the dreamless sleep. By the self-support ing parampt man all these threefold categories were fashioned. May he, the Lord, join us with beneficial remembrance. He who is superior to all, who has been revealed in the Vedas, who is the supreme seer and who sees Hilyagava who is the first among the gods and who is born before all the rest. Other than whom there is nothing higher, nothing subtler, nothing greater, by that Puruya. The one who stands still like a tree established in heaven. All this is filled. Yogi Rupnath Ji said, Vedas says to absolute soul, not by work, not by progeny, not by wealth, they have attained immortality. Some have attained immortality by renunciation. That which the hermits attain is laid beyond the heaven. Yet it shines brilliantly in the purified heart. Having attained the immortality consisting of identity with the Supreme, all those aspirants who strive for self-control, who have rigorously arrived at the conclusion taught by the Vedanta through direct knowledge, and who have attained purity of mind through the practice of the discipline of Yoga and steadfastness in the knowledge of Brahman preceded by renunciation, get themselves released into the region of Brahman at the dissolution of their final body. In the citadel of the body there is the small sinless and pure lotus of the heart which is the residence of the Supreme. Further, in the interior of this small area, there is the sorrowless ether. That is to be meditated upon continually. He is the Supreme Lord who transcends the syllable Om which is uttered at the commencement of the recital of the Vedas, which is well established in the Upanishads and which is dissolved in the primal cause during contemplation. Yogi Rupnath Ji then said, this universe is truly the divine person only. Therefore it subsists on him, the self-effulgent divine being, who has many heads and many eyes, who is the producer of joy for the universe, who exists in the form of the universe, who is the master and the cause of humanity, whose forms are the various gods, who is imperishable, who is the all-surpassing ruler and savior, who is superior to the world, who is endless and omniform, who is the goal of humanity, who is the destroyer of sin and ignorance, who is the protector of the universe and the ruler of individual souls, who is permanent, supremely auspicious and unchanging, who has embodied himself in man as his support being the indwelling spirit, who is supremely worthy of being known by the creatures, who is embodied in the universe and who is the supreme goal. Narayana is the supreme reality designed as Brahman. Narayana is the highest self. Nraya is the supreme light described in the Upanishads. Narayana is the infinite self. Narayana is the most excellent meditator and meditation. Whatsoever there is in this world, known through perception, because of their proximity, or known through report, 
because of their distance, all that is pervaded by Nraya within and without. One should meditate upon the Supreme, the limitless, unchanging, all-knowing, cause of the happiness of the world, dwelling in the sea of one's own heart, as the goal of all striving. The place for his meditation is the ether in the heart. The heart which is comparable to an inverted lotus bud. It should be known that the heart, which is located just at the distance of a finger span below the Adam's apple and above the navel, is the great abode of the universe. Like the bud of a lotus, suspends in an inverted position, the heart, surrounded by arteries. In it there is a narrow space or near it there is a narrow space called Susumna. In it everything is supported. In the middle of that, narrow space of the heart or Susumna, remains the undecaying, all-knowing, omni-faced, great fire, which has flames on every side, which enjoys the food presented before it, which remains assimilating the food consumed, the rays of which spread scatter ing themselves vertically and horizontally, and which warms its own body from the insole to the crown. In the center of that fire which permeates the whole body, there abides a tongue of fire, of the color of shining gold, which is the topmost among the subtle, which is dazzling like the flash of the lightning that appears in the middle of a rain-bearing cloud, which is as slender as the dawn of a paddy grain, and which serves as a comparison to illustrate subtlety. Paramatman dwells in the middle of that flame. Although he is thus limited, still he is the four-faced creator, Shiva, Vishnu, Indra, the material and efficient cause of the universe and the supreme self-luminous pure consciousness. Verily, Aditya is he, this orb of his gives light and heat, the well-known Rig verses are there, therefore the orb is the collection of Rig. He is the abode of the Rig verses. Now this flame which is shining in the orb of the sun is the collection of Sman chants, that is the abode of Saman chants. Now he who is the person in the flame within the orb of the sun, is to be meditated as, the collection of Yajus. That part of the orb is the collection of Yajus, that is the abode of Yajus. Thus by these three, the threefold knowledge alone shines. He who is within the sun is the golden person. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Vedas prayer says, the sun that is Paramatman the absolute soul, alone is verily all these, energy, splendor, strength, renown, sight, hearing, body, mind, anger, seer, the deities death, satya, mitra, wind, ether and breath, the rulers of the world, prajapti, the indeterminable one, happiness, that which transcends the senses, truth, food, span of life, liberation or immortality, individual soul, the universe, the acme of bliss and the self-born Brahman. This unique person in the sun is eternal. He is the lord of all creatures. He who meditates thus upon him attains union with Brahman and lives in the same region of enjoyment with him, he attains union, co-residence and like enjoyment with these gods in their worlds. The secret knowledge is thus imparted. Aditya, the supreme cause of the universe, is the giver of light and water and is the source of all energy. He is denoted by the syllable Om. Gods worship him as tapas and truth. Being worshipped thus, he grants bliss to the worshippers or the worshippers offer honey and sweet offerings to him. That form of the sun is Brahman. That is the pervading cause of all. That is water, fire, flavor and ambrosia. The three vyuhtis representing the three worlds and the prava representing the cause of the universe denote that Brahman. By these twenty-two names ending with salutations they consecrate the Sivlinga for all. The ling which is representative of Soma and Surya, and holding which in the hand holy formulas are repeated and which purifies all. I take refuge in Sedyujata. Verily I salute Sedyujata again and again. O Sedyujata, do not consign me to repeated birth, lead me beyond birth, into the state of bliss and liberation. I bow down to him who is the source of transmigratory existence. Salutation to Vama Deva. Salutation to Jayastha. Salutation to Sristha. Salutation to Rudra. Salutation to Kala. Salutation to Kalavikrana. Salutation to Balvikrana. Salutation to Bala. Salutation to Balapramatna. Salutation to Savabtadamana. 
Salutation to Manonmana. Now, O Sav, my salutations be at all times and all places to thy Rudra forms, benign, terrific, more terrific and destructive. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Veda's prayer says to him, May we know or realize the Supreme Person. For that, may we meditate upon Mahdeva and to that meditation may Rudra impel us. O Shiva Gayatri or may the Supreme who is the luster of all knowledge, controller of all created beings, the preserver of the Vedas and the one overlord of Hiryagava, be benign to me. I am the Sadiva described thus and denoted by Pranav. Salutations again and again to Hiranyabahu, Hiranyavana, Hiranyarupa, Hiranyapati, Ambikapati, Umapati, Pasupti. Yogi Rupnathji says, Supreme Brahman, the Absolute Reality, has become an androgynous person in the form of Oma Maswara, dark blue and reddish brown in hue, absolutely chaste and possessing uncommon eyes. Salutations to him alone who is the soul of the universe or whose form is the universe. All this verily is Rudra. To Rudra who is such we offer our salutation. We salute again and again that being, Rudra, who alone is the light and the soul of creatures. The material universe, the created beings and whatever there is manifold and profusely created in the past and in the present in the form of the world, all that is indeed this Rudra. Salutations be to Rudra who is such. We sing a hymn that confers on us happiness in the highest degree, to Rudra who is worthy of praise, who is endowed with the highest knowledge, who reigns objects to the worshippers most excellently, who is more powerful and who is dwelling in the heart. Indeed all this is Rudra. Salutations be to Rudra who is such. He who has the sacrificial ladle made of wick cut tree for his Agnihokra rite offers oblations effective in producing the desired fruit. Further, these oblations contribute to establish his spiritual knowledge through the generation of mental purity. The sage Vasistha declared that Aditi is the mother and protector of gods, of celestial minstrels, of men, of departed ancestors, of demons and others. That she is possessed of hardness or cohesiveness, that she is excellent and honored, that she belongs to the divine spirit, that she is fit to be praised, contingent and supporting all, that she is rich in crops, broad and possessing a wealth of objects, that she is universal and comprising of the primary element, that she is exceedingly blissful, transformed into the bodies of creatures, illustrious, enduring and hence immortal. Verily all this is water. All the created beings are water. The vital breaths in the body are water. Quadrupeds are water. Edible crops are water. Ambrosia is water. Sumt is water. Wurt is water. Swart is water. The mitters are water. The luminaries are water. Vedic formulas are water. Truth is water. All deities are water. The three worlds denoted by Bhu, Bhuva and Suva are water. The source of all these is the Supreme, denoted by the syllable. Om. Veda's prayer hymn says, May this water cleanse my physical body that is made of earthy substances. Thus purified, may the earthy body purify me, the soul within. May this water purify the guardian of the Vedas, my preceptor. May the purified Vedas taught by the purified teacher purify me or may the Supreme purify me. May the water purified by the Supreme purify me. My defilement, repast on prohibited food and misconduct if any, and the sin accruing from the acceptance of gifts from persons disapproved by the scripture, from all these may I be absolved. May the waters purify me. Hail. May fire, anger and guardians of anger guard me from the sins resulting from anger. May the day efface completely whatever sin I have committed on this day by thought, word, hands, feet, stomach and the procreative organ. Further, whatever sinful deed has been committed by me, all that and myself I offer as an oblation into the self-luminous truth, the source of immortality. Hail. May the sun, anger and the guardians of anger guard me from the sins resulting from anger. May the night efface completely whatever sin I have committed during the last night by thought, word, hands, feet, stomach and the procreative organ. Further, whatever sinful deed has been committed by me, 
all that and myself I offer as an oblation into the supreme light represented by the sun, the source of immortality. Hail! Yogi Rupnathji then said, the one syllable. Om! Is Brahman. Agni is its deity. Its eye also is Brahman. Its mitter is Gyakra. Its use is for the union with Parampman who exists as the manifold universe. May the boon conferring divine Gyakra come to us, in order to instruct us about, the imperishable Brahman who is determined by the Vedanta. May Gyakra, the mother of mitters, favor us with the supreme just mentioned. O thou who art the source of all letters, O thou the great deity, O thou the object of meditation at twilight, O thou Saraswak, may thy devotee be liberated from the sin, which he commits during the day, by the same day and the sin, which he commits during the night, by the same night. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Veda's prayer says as her, O Gayatri, thou art the essence of strength. Thou art patience, or the subduing power. Thou art physical capacity. Thou art splendor. Thou art the abode of gods and their name. Thou art the insentient universe. Thou art the full span of life or the lord of all. Thou art every living thing. Thou art the life span of all. Thou art the vanquisher of all that is hostile to us. Thou art the truth denoted by the pranav. I invoke Gayatri, into my heart. I invoke Savitri. I invoke Saraswati. I invoke the Mitas, the Rishis and the Gods. I invoke the splendor of all the Gods. Of Gayatri the Mitta is Gayatri, the Rishi is Viswamitra and the Deity is Savitri. Fire represents the mouth. The four-faced Brahma, the head. Vishnu, the heart, Rudra, the crown hair, earth, the source. The Ambreth, the outbreath, the diffused breath, the upbreath and the middle breath, the breath. Gayatri is fair in hue and is of the same family as Paramatman attained by the Sankhyas. The illumined sages. The deity Gayatri, explained further as a formula, has 24 syllables, comprised in three feet, six sheaths or cavities and five heads. It is employed in Upanayan, or initiation into Vedic studentship. Om Earth Om Sky Om Heaven Om Middle Region Om Place of Birth Om Mansion of the Blessed Om Abode of Truth Om May we meditate on the adorable light of that divine generator who quickens our understandings. Om He is Water, Light, Flavor, Ambrosia and also the Three Worlds. He who is denoted by Pranav is all these. O Goddess, Thou mayest go and remain at thy pleasure on the highest and holiest peak on the earth, or in any high place until the Brahmas remember thee again. May the boon conferring mother of the Vedas, who has been magnified by me, who impels the created beings like wind and who has two places of birth, depart to the excellently produced world of Brahman, having conferred on me, here on the earth, long life, wealth and power of Vedic learning. The imperishable Dikya who is the giver of luster and the creator of the universe moves in the sky like his own race. The essence of him in the form of sweet water flows in the shape of rivers. He is the truth. Dikya, the supreme cause of the universe, is the giver of light and water and is the source of all energy. He is denoted by the syllable Om. Gods worship him as tapas and truth. Being worshipped thus, he grants bliss to the worshippers or the worshippers offer honey and sweet offerings to him. That form of the sun is Brahman. That is the pervading cause of all. That is water, fire, flavor and ambrosia. The three vyhtis representing the three worlds and the prava representing the cause of the universe denote that Brahman. Yogi Rupnathji said, Veda's prayer saying, May the Supreme reach me. May the blissful reach me. May the Supreme alone that is blissful reach me. O Lord, being one among thy creatures I am thy child. Suppress the dreary dream of the empirical existence that I experience. For that I offer myself as an oblation into thee, O Lord, and the vital and mental powers, thou hast kept in me. One may impart Trisupara to a Brahma unsolicited. Those Brahmas who recite Trisupara indeed destroy even the sin of killing a Brahma. They attain to the fruit of the performance of Soma sacrifice. 
They purify all those who sit in a row of a thousand, while at dinner, and attain union with Prava that is the deity of this mantra. Yogi Rupnathji then said, that Brahman is attained through the power of intelligence. That bliss is attained through the power of intelligence. The bliss which is indeed Brahman is attained through the power of intelligence. Vedas pray to him, O God, O Thou Creator, vouchsafe to us today the prosperity consisting of progeny. Turn away from us this bad dream of the world. O God, O Creator, turn away from me all the sins. Bring to me that which is beneficial. To me, who is the devotee of the Supreme Truth, let the wine blow sweetly. Let the rivers run sweetly. Let the herbs be to us sweet and beneficial. Let there be sweetness day and night. Let the particles of the earth be sweetness bearing. Let heaven, our Father, be sweet to us. Let the fruit bearing trees be sweet to us. Let the sun be sweet and beneficial to us. Let the cows be sweetness bearing to us. One may impart Trisupara to a Brahma unsolicited. Those Brahmas who recite Trisupara indeed destroy even the sin of feticide or hurting a Brahma well versed in the Vedas and in their auxiliaries. They attain to the fruit of the performance of Soma sacrifice. They purify all those who sit in a row of a thousand, while at dinner, and attain union with Prava, that is, the deity of this mantra. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Vedas pray him as, Brahma Madhav, Madhu Madhav, Brahmamava Madhu Madhav, Brahm Devan Padav Kavnmi Vipra Mahayo Mg Avit Macron Avit Macron M, Saino GDDH Avit Macron Avit Macron Swadhiti Vanna Soma Pavitra Makyati Rebat, Hasa Yushadva Surantarika Sadok Vedia the Titi Duroizak, Nadwara Sadthasa Vyumesa Dabjek Gojtaj Adrij Tabat, means. This is the third Trisupara made up of three units, Madhav substituting the word Madhai. The term Madhav is a disguised form of Madhva that is possessing or connected with Madh or sacrifice. The idea behind the expression is that the Supreme Brahman is attained only by a person in whom the desire for self-knowledge is generated by the proper performance of prescribed duties and sacrifices. Thus Brahman is connected with Madh, sacrifice, insofar as sacrifices and other similar activities help one from a distance for the realization of Brahman by creating purity of mind and desire for knowledge. It may be noted that the first Trisupara prescribes a meditation in the shape of offering oneself into the Supreme as a means of attaining Him. The second one stresses the need of knowledge engendered through intelligence developed by scripture, preceptor, and proper environment, and the third one here emphasizes karma or Vedic sacrifice as an aid to the attainment of the Supreme. Yogi Rupnathji then says to him, I pile fuel in the consecrated fire with a view to acquire the Vedas necessary for thy worship, meditating on thee in the form of Igved. The unbroken currents of clarified butter offered into the kindled fire, rendered sacred by cordial and hearty thoughts, flow like rivers, the water of which is potable for gods. By this I kindled the splendor of the holy fire. In that Havaya fire, amidst those currents of clarified butter offered as oblation, abides the profusely rich and splendid supreme being who is magnified in the Trisupara, who dwells in the nest of the bodies of created beings, who confers bliss on creatures according to their merit, and who shares with God's sweet ambrosia in the form of oblations offered by worshippers in fire. In his proximity are seated the seven sages who destroy sins by mere remembrance and who continuously pour oblations in the form of a current of nectar keeping in mind the various gods for whom they are meant. This Trisupara may be imparted to a Brahma unsolicited. Those Brahmas who recite Trisupara indeed destroy even the sin of slaying a worthy Brahma or an anointed king. They attain to the fruit of the performance of Soma sacrifice. They purify all those who sit in a row of a thousand, while at dinner, and attain union with Prava, that is, the deity of this mantra. May the all-penetrating goddess of intellect who is beneficial, favorably disposed to, and delighting in, us visit us. O Goddess, may we who were delighting in profitless speech before thy visit, now as the result of thy delight in us, become enlightened and also capable of expressing the supreme truth along with our heroic sons and disciples. O Goddess of intellect, favored by thee, one becomes a seer. One becomes a Brahma or a knower of Brahman. Favored by thee one becomes also possessed of riches. 
favored by thee one obtains manifold wealth. Being such, O goddess of intellect, delight in us and confer on us wealth. Yogi Rupnath Ji said, Vedas prayer say, May Indra grant me intelligence. May goddess Saraswat grant me intelligence. May the two Avna wearing garlands of lotus flowers engender in me intelligence. Hell. May that intelligence favor me. That which is possessed by Apsas, celestial women, that which is the mental power in Gandharvs, celestial minstrels, that intelligence expressed as the divine Vedic law and that intelligence which spreads like fragrance. May that goddess of intelligence come to me with a joyful face and favor me. That goddess of intelligence who is pervasive like fragrance, who is capable of examining all objects, who possesses golden letters in the shape of the syllables of the Vedas, or who is wholesome and charming, who is continuously present, who is fit to be resorted to by the seekers of the values of life again and again, who possesses flavor and strength and who nourishes me with milk and other wealth. May Agni render in me intelligence, continuity of progeny and splendor born of Vedic study. May Indra render in me intelligence, continuity of progeny and virility. May Sraya render in me intelligence, continuity of progeny and prowess that strikes fear in the hearts of enemies. May death depart from us. May immortality come to us. May Vavaswatariyam grant us safety. May the sins of us be destroyed like the seared leaves of a tree. May the strength giving wealth come to us. Vedas prayer called, Yogi Rupnath Ji say, O death, go back by thy own path which is other than that of the gods. I entreat thee who art capable of seeing me and listening to me. Do not destroy our progeny. Do not strike down our heroes. We heartily supplicate to the Lord of creatures, who is the protector of the universe and who is active within us as life breath and outside us as the blowing wind. May he guard us from death and protect us from sin. May we live brilliantly up to our old age. O thou supreme being, release me from the fear of yam and accusation of people and the necessity of being in the yonder world. O Agni, may the two divine physicians, the Avna, chase away from us death by virtue of the powers of religious work. Yogi Rupnath Ji says, Like servants gods follow Hari who is the lord of the universe, who leads all thoughts as the foremost leader and who absorbs into himself the universe at the time of dissolution or who destroys the sins of devotees. May this path to liberation taught in the Vedas having the same form as Brahman open itself to me. Deprive not me of that. Strive to secure it for me. Kindling the consecrated fire with chips of wood, in order to offer oblations during worship, may I attain both the worlds. Having attained the prosperity of this world and the next I shall cross over death. Yogi Rupnath Ji then said, Vedas prayer him, O fears death, do not cut off my life. Do not injure, my interest. Do not cripple my strength. Do not subject me to deprivation. Do not hurt my progeny and life. I shall serve thee with oblations. For, thou art vigilant over the deeds of men. O Rudra, injure not our elders, our children, our adults capable of procreation, the fetus we have laid in the mother's womb and our father and mother. Do not hurt our dear selves. O Rudra, do not hurt us in respect of our children, our grandchildren, other men belonging to us, our cattle and our horses. Do not hurt in anger our heroes. We shall serve thee with oblations and reverence. O Prajpati, all that is born is not different from thee. Thou art before them and after also when they are reabsorbed into thee. The created beings cannot surpass thee. With whatever desire we offer oblations to thee may that be fulfilled. May we become lords of riches. May Indra come to our succor, Indra who is the giver of welfare on earth and bliss in the next world, who is the lord of people, who is the slayer of Vtra, who is the subduer of enemies and giver of rain, who is peaceable and giver of safety. We worship the three-eyed lord who is fragrant and who increasingly nourishes the devotees. Worshipping him may we easily slip off from death just as the ripe cucumber easily separates itself from the binding stalk. May we be never separated from immortality. O death, those thousand and ten thousand snares which thou hast laid for slaying man, 
all of them we remove by the power of our deeds of worship. Hell. May this be an oblation made to meet you, the maker of death. Then Yogi Rupnathji said, Vedas prayer say, O Agni, thou art the remover of the offenses we have committed against gods. Hell. Thou art the remover of the offenses we have committed against men. Hell. Thou art the remover of the offenses we have committed against departed ancestors. Hell. Thou art the remover of the offenses we have committed to ourselves. Hell. Thou art the remover of the offenses committed by others connected with us. Hell. Thou art the remover of the offenses committed by our relatives. Hell. Thou art the remover of the offenses committed during day and night. Hell. Thou art the remover of the offenses committed in the state of dream and waking hell. Thou art the remover of the offenses we have committed in the state of deep sleep and waking. Hell. Thou art the remover of the offenses committed consciously and unconsciously hell. Thou art the remover of the offenses committed by contact with those who are sinners hell. O gods, of us, that serious God offending sin which we have committed by our tongues, by our understanding, and by our actions, place that in those who come near and act in an evil way towards us. Hell. Salutations to the gods. Desire performed the act. Desire did the act. Desire is doing the act, not I desire is the agent, not I desire causes the doer to act, not I owe desire, fascinating in form, let this oblation be offered to the hell. Salutations to the gods. Anger performed the act. Anger did the act. Anger is doing the act, not I anger is the agent. Not I anger causes the doer to act, not I owe anger, let this oblation be offered to thee. Hell. O Supreme Being, I offer oblations of tasty pillar, sesame, seeds mixed with some flour, into the consecrated fire, may my mind delight in the attributes of the Supreme. Hell. O God, through thy grace, may I obtain cattle, gold, wealth, food and drink, and all desired objects and beauty and prosperity, for that this oblation be offered to thee. Hell. May God grant me royal prosperity, the bliss of freedom, health, noble repute, capacity to pay off the debts to gods, departed souls and sages, the qualities of an ideal Brahma, many sons, faith, intelligence and grandsons. May this oblation be offered for that. Hell. O Lord, through thy grace, may these black sesame seeds, white sesame seeds, Healthful sesame seeds and own sesame seeds cleanse whatever sin there is connected with me or whatever ruin there is in me. For that I offer oblations. Hell. May the sesame seeds offered remove my sins, such as partaking of the food supplied by theft, dining at a place where food is served in connection with the funeral rites of a single recently departed soul, slaying of a Brahma, outraging the preceptor's honor, cattle lifting, drink and slaying a hero or a fetus may I have peace. Hell. May God grant me royal prosperity, the bliss of freedom, health, noble repute, capacity to pay off the debts to gods, departed souls and sages, the qualities of an ideal Brahma, many sons, faith, intelligence and grandsons. May this oblation be offered for that. Hail Ujtavedas, the all-knowing supreme invoked in fire. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Vedas prayer to him, saying, By this oblation may my in-breath, out-breath, diffused breath, up-breath and middle-breath become purified. I pray that I become the supreme light bereft of all obstructing sins and their coys, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be appropriately offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. By this oblation may my speech, mind, sight, Hearing, taste, smell, seed, intellect, intention and aim become purified. I pray that I become the supreme light bereft of all obstructing sins and their coys, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be appropriately offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. By this oblation may my seven bodily ingredients, outer and inner skin, flesh, blood, fat, marrow, sinew and bone, become purified. 
I pray that I become the supreme light bereft of all obstructing sins and their cause, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. By this oblation may the limbs and the parts of my body, comprised by the head, hands, feel, sides, back, thighs, belly, shanks, the generative organ, the middle part of the body, or the male and female generative organs, and the anus become purified. I pray that I become the supreme light bereft of all obstructing sins and their cause, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Veda's prayer says to him, O thou divine person, who is dark blue and brown and who is red in eyes make haste to favor me. Grant me more and more purity. Be a grantor of knowledge and purity to me through the medium of my preceptor. May my thoughts become purified. I pray that I become the supreme light bereft of all obstructing sins and their cause, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be offered into the consecrated fire hell. By this oblation may the five constituent elements of my body, earth, water, fire, air and ether, become purified. I pray that I become the supreme light, bereft of all obstructing sins and their cause, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. By this oblation may the qualities of sound, touch, color, taste and smell, residing in the above five elements constituting my body, become purified. I pray that I become the supreme light, bereft of all obstructing sins and their cause, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. By this oblation may the deeds accomplished by my mind, speech and body become purified. I pray that I become the supreme light, bereft of all obstructing sins and their cause, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. May I have not any suppressed feelings of egoism. I pray that I become the supreme light, bereft of all obstructing sins and their cause, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. By this oblation may my body become purified. I pray that I become the supreme light, bereft of all obstructing sins and their cause, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. By this oblation may my internal organs become purified. I pray that I become the supreme light, bereft of all obstructing sins and their cause, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. By this oblation may my infinite self become purified. I pray that I become the supreme light, bereft of all obstructing sins and their cause, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. May this oblation be made to the deity of hunger. Hell. May this oblation be made to the conjoined deities of hunger and thirst. Hell. May this oblation be made to the all-pervasive supreme. Hell. May this oblation be made to the supreme who is the ordainer of big chants. Hell. May this oblation be made to the supreme who is interested in his creation. Hell. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Veda's prayer him says to, O Lord, through thy grace I remove from me that uncleanness in the form of hunger and thirst, misfortune and adversity, poverty and lack of progress, and all the like. Efface my sins. Hell. By this oblation may my fivefold self comprised by the sheaths of food, breath, mind, intelligence and bliss become purified. I pray that I become the supreme light bereft of all obstructing sins and their cause, the passions, in me. For this end may this oblation be offered into the consecrated fire. Hell. Whenever offerings are made to the mains, the deities and men, the terms employed for oblations are Savda, Nama and Hanta respectively. These special words of address give them pleasure. Gods, like guests, are made happy by sweet words of courtesy. The word pity denotes two types of superhuman beings, 
those who are permanent dwellers of the Piti Loka and those who are translated to that region from the earth when they depart from the body. Just as a perennial well is supplied with water by hundreds and thousands of springs, so may I have an inexhaustible supply of grain from a thousand sources. For that end, I offer oblations to the wealth-holding deity. Hail! With the intention of acquiring prosperity, I present offering of food to those spirits who are the servants of Rudra, dwelling on the cremation ground, causing pain to creatures by death and bereavement, and who wander about day and night in search of tribute. May the Lord of Prosperity grant me all prosperity. Hail! Yogi Rupnathji then says, Om that is Brahman. Om that is view. Om that is the finite self. Om that is the supreme truth. Om that is all. Om that is the multitude of citadels, the bodies of creatures. Salutations to him. That supreme being moves inside the heart of created beings possessing manifold forms. O supreme, thou art the sacrifice, thou art the expression wa, thou art Indra, thou art Rudra, thou art Brahma, thou art Prajpati, thou art that, thou art the water in the rivers and the ocean, thou art the sun, thou art flavor, thou art ambrosia, thou art the body of the Vedas, thou art the threefold world and thou art Om. Firm in my religious faith, I offer this oblation of ambrosia into pra with reverence. Firm in my religious faith, I offer this oblation of ambrosia into apna with reverence. Firm in my religious faith, I offer this oblation of ambrosia into vyana with reverence. Firm in my religious faith, I offer this oblation of ambrosia into udna with reverence. Firm in my religious faith, I offer this oblation of ambrosia into sunna with reverence. By these oblations may myself be united with the Supreme, so that I may attain immortality. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Veda's prayer says, O water, thou art the spread out seat of Annabhman, the immortal food. Firm in my religious faith, I offer this oblation of ambrosia into pra with reverence, O thou offered substance, be auspicious and get assimilated into me, so that I may not be consumed by hunger. Priya Sav. Firm in my religious faith, I offer this oblation of ambrosia into apna with reverence. O thou offered substance, be auspicious and get assimilated into me, so that I may not be consumed by hunger. Apnya Sav. Firm in my religious faith, I offer this oblation of ambrosia into Vyana with reverence. O thou offered substance, be auspicious and get assimilated into me, so that I may not be consumed by hunger. Vyanya Sav. Firm in my religious faith, I offer this oblation of ambrosia into Udna with reverence. O thou offered substance, be auspicious and get assimilated into me, so that I may not be consumed by hunger. Udnya Sav. Firm in my religious faith, I offer this oblation of ambrosia into Sunna with reverence. O thou offered substance, be auspicious and get assimilated into me so that I may not be consumed by hunger. Sanya Sav. By these oblations may myself be united with the Supreme, so that I may attain immortality. O water, thou art the cover for Anna Brahman, the immortal food. Firm in my religious faith, I have offered this oblation of ambrosia into pra with reverence, O pra, increase the power of my inbreath by this food. Firm in my religious faith, I have offered this oblation of ambrosia into apna with reverence, O apna, increase the power of my outbreath with this food. Firm in my religious faith, I have offered this oblation of ambrosia into vyana with reverence, O vyana, increase the power of my diffused breath with this food. Firm in my religious faith, I have offered this oblation of ambrosia into udna with reverence, O udna, increase the power of my upbreath with this food. Firm in my religious faith, I have offered this oblation of ambrosia into sunna with reverence, O sunna, increase the power of my middle breath with this food. May the Supreme Lord be gratified, by this meal just taken, who is the ruler of all the world and the enjoyer of all, who as the person dwelling in the body, is of the size of the thumb, and who is the support of the body, imparting to it sentience and activity from the toe to the crown. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Veda's prayer says to him, O Lord, 
after repast my powers of speech, of breath, of sight, and of hearing, are firm in their respective stations that is, mouth, nostrils, eyes and ears, so also strength and vitality have returned to my aims and thighs. My subtle body and my gross body with all its limbs are now free from inadequacy. My salutation to thee. Do not cause any hurt to me and mine. Yogi Rupnathji then said, like birds with handsome plumage the sages who were devoted to sacrificial worship, or intent on the good of all, approached Indra supplicating thus, remove our darkness and ignorance. Fill our eyes with worthy sights. And release us from the bondage of ignorance like birds trapped in snares. Vedas says to him, O Jnana Rudra, thou art the binding knot of the breaths and the organs of senses functioning in the body. Enter me as the end maker of sorrows and increase and protect me by that food which I have taken in. Salutations to Rudra, and to Vishnu or Rudra who is Vishnu. Guard me from death. O Agni, thou art born on the days of sacrifices as the protector of men in general and of those among men who offer sacrifices. Thou art born spreading light around, or causing pain quickly by mere touch. Thou art born from water as lightning or as the heat under the sea. Thou art born from clouds or stones by friction. Thou art born from the forests. Thou art born from the herbs. Thou art born ever pure or as the sun. O thou Lord, who art worshipped in all the sacrifices, I prostrate before thee in deep reverence, I prostrate before thee. I prostrate before thee. Deign to remain with me as the giver of what is auspicious. Deign to remain with me as the giver of happiness here. Deign to remain with me as the giver of good and divine qualities. Deign to remain with me as the giver of splendor born of Vedic learning. When the sacrifice which I have instituted has been completed prosperously, be with me to confer the fruits of it. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Truthfulness is excellent. What is excellent is truthfulness only. By truthfulness those who have attained to the state of blissfulness never fall from there. What belongs to Sat? namely good people that is indeed satyam truthfulness. For this reason seekers of the highest good find delight in truthfulness. Some hold the opinion that austerity is the means of liberation and that there is no austerity higher than religious fast. This excellent austerity is hard to be practiced. A person who practices it becomes invincible or such austerity is unthinkable for the commonalty. Therefore seekers of the highest good delight in austerity. Perfect ascetics declare that withdrawal of the senses from the attraction of forbidden objects is the means of liberation. Therefore they delight in it. Hermits who dwell in the forest consider that tranquility of mind is the means of liberation, and therefore they delight in calmness. All creatures praise selfless gift as supreme, for there is nothing more difficult to perform than giving selfless gift. Therefore seekers of the highest good delight in giving selfless gift. Yogi Rupnathji says, some consider that scriptural duty is the means of liberation. By the performance of scriptural duties all the world is held together. There is nothing more difficult to practice than the duties ordained by the scriptures. Therefore seekers of the highest good find delight in the scriptural duty. The largest number of people consider that procreation is the means of liberation. For that reason the largest number of offsprings is born. Because procreation is deemed such a means, therefore the largest number of people delight in procreation. Someone devoted to the Vedic religion says that the Vedic fires are the means of liberation. Therefore the Vedic fires must be consecrated. Another person devoted to the Vedic religion says that Agnihokra is the means of liberation. Therefore some seekers of the highest good delight in the Agnihokra sacrifice. Others devoted to the Vedic religion say that sacrifice is the means of liberation. Verily, gods have attained heaven by their own prior deeds of sacrifice. Therefore seekers of the highest good delight in the performance of sacrifice. Some wise people consider that inward worship is the means of liberation. Therefore wise people delight only in inward worship. Yogi Rupnathji then said, whereas in Vedas, Brahma Hiryagava considers that Sannisa is the means of liberation. Hiryagava is indeed the supreme. The Supreme alone is Hiryagava although he is a personality. Certainly these austerities set forth above are inferior. Sannisa alone surpassed all. 
to him who thus knows the all-transcending excellence of Sannisa precious knowledge has been imparted. By truth the wind blows. By truth the sun shines in the sky. Truth is the foundation of speech. Everything in practical life depends on truth. Therefore they say truth is the supreme means of liberation. By tapas performed in the beginning gods attained godhood. By tapas seers attained to heaven gradually. By tapas we get rid of our enemies who stand in the way of our acquisitions. Everything is founded in tapas. Therefore they say tapas is the supreme means of liberation. Yogi Rupnathji then said, Persons who practice sense control shake off their sin by that. Perfect ascetics reached heaven gradually through sense control. Sense control is inaccessible to ordinary creatures. Everything is founded in sense control. Therefore they say sense control is the supreme means of liberation. Those who are of a tranquil disposition do good merely by calmness. Sages have attained to heaven through calmness of mind. Calmness of mind is inaccessible for the ordinary creatures. Everything is founded on calmness of mind. Therefore they say that calmness of mind is the supreme means of liberation. Giving of gift in the shape of Daki is the secure abode of the sacrifices. In the world all creatures subsist on a giver. People remove by gifts those who are envious and malignant towards them. By gift the unfriendly become friendly. Everything is established in gift. Therefore they say that the gift is the supreme means of liberation. The religious righteousness is the support of the whole universe. All people draw near a person who is fully devoted to them. Through them a person chases away sin. All are supported by them. Therefore they say that them is the supreme means of liberation. Yogi Rupnathji says, in this world procreation is certainly the foundation of the race. A person who extends the continuity of progeny in the right way by rearing offsprings, according to the scriptural rules, discharges his debt towards his departed ancestors. That alone is the way for him to pay off his debts towards his ancestors. Therefore they say that procreation is the supreme means of liberation. The great sacrificial fires are indeed the threefold knowledge and the path leading to godhood. Of them, the Grahpakya fire is Rigveda, the earth and the Rthantara summon chant. Anvriyapakna is Yajurveda mid-region and the Vmadevya summon chant, Haveya is the Smaveda, the heavenly worlds and the Brihat summon chant. Therefore they say that the sacrificial fires are the supreme means of liberation. The performance of Agnihokra at dawn and sunset is expiation for sins incidental to housekeeping. It is a good yajna and a good homa and also it is the commencement of all yajnas and krahu. It is a beacon to the heavenly world. Therefore they say Agnihokra is the supreme means of liberation. Others devoted to the Vedic religion say that sacrifice is the means of liberation. Sacrifice is indeed dear to gods. Verily, gods have attained to heaven by their previous deeds of sacrifice. They have driven away demons by sacrifice. By sacrifice those who are hostile become friendly. Everything is supported by sacrifice. Therefore they say sacrifice is the supreme means of liberation. Inward worship or mental concentration is indeed the means of attaining to the state of prajpati and so that is holy. Those who possess a mind endowed with the power of inward concentration see and realize what is good. Through mental concentration, seers like Vivmitra created subjects by mere wish. All depends upon this power of the mind. Therefore they say that the power of inward concentration is the supreme means of liberation. Wise seers declare that Sannisa mentioned as the supreme means of liberation is Brahman, and that Brahman is the universal spirit, is supremely blissful, is self-born, is the protector of created beings, is the soul of time, and so forth. The year is the yonder sun. That person, who is in the sun, is he Yagaba, he is Parameh, the protector of the universe, and Brahman, supreme reality that is the innermost self of all creatures. Those rays by which the sun gives heat, the same rays transform water into rain cloud which showers the rain. By the rain cloud herbs and trees come into existence from herbs and trees food is produced. By the use of food the breaths and senses are nourished. When the life breath is nourished one gets bodily strength. Bodily strength gives the capacity to practice tapas. 
in the shape of self-control, religious fast, and so forth. As the result of such tapas, faith in scriptural truths springs into existence. By faith mental power comes. By mental power sense control is made possible. By sense control reflection is engendered. From reflection calmness of mind results. Conclusive experience of truth follows calmness. By conclusive experience of truth remembrance of it is engendered. Remembrance produces continuous remembrance. From continuous remembrance results unbroken direct realization of truth. By such realization a person knows the Timan. For this reason, he who gives food gives all these. For, it is found that the vital breaths and the senses of creatures are from food, that reflection functions with the vital breath and the senses, that unbroken direct realization comes from reflection and that bliss comes from unbroken direct realization of truth. Thus having attained bliss one becomes the supreme which is the source of the universe. He by whom all this universe is pervaded, the earth and the mid-region, the heaven and the quarters and the sub-quarters, that person is fivefold and is constituted of five substances. Yogi Rupnathji then said, He who has attained supreme knowledge through Sunnisa is, indeed, this person. He is all that is perceptible at present, was in the past and will be in the future. Though apparently human, his true nature is that which is settled by the enquiry into the Vedas and what is attained by his new birth in right knowledge. He is firmly established in the richness of knowledge imparted by his Guru, as also in his faith and in truth. He has become the self-resplendent being such a one he remains beyond the darkness of ignorance. O oh friends, having become one possessed of knowledge by realizing him, the Supreme, through Sunnisa, and with your mind fixed in the heart, do not again fall a prey to death. Because Sunnisa is thus the supreme means of realization, therefore wise men declare that to be above all other means of liberation. O Supreme, Thou art the giver of the wealth of supreme knowledge to us. Thou hast become all. Thou unitest the individual souls in the strut man. Thou pervadest the universe. Thou art the giver of the luster to fire. Thou art the giver of light and heat to the sun. Thou art the bestower of the riches of light to the moon. Thou art taken in the Opema vessel as Soma juice for oblation. We worship thee, the Supreme who art such for the manifestation of light. The Sun Yasin having meditated upon the Supreme, should concentrate his thoughts on him uttering the syllable Om. This, the syllable Om, verily is the substance of many great Upniads and a secret guarded by the gods without imparting to the unfit. He who practices meditation on the Supreme thus, with the aid of Prava, after Sunnisa attains to the unlimited greatness of the Supreme. By that he attains the greatness of Brahman. Thus the secret knowledge has been imparted. Now I am going to say some important meanings, follow these words attentively. Said Yogi Rupnathji, the institutor of the sacrifice, in the case of the sacrifice offered by a Sunnisin who has attained supreme knowledge in the manner already described, is his own self. His faith is his wife. His body is his sacrificial fuel. His chest is his altar. His hairs are his holy grass, the way that he has learnt is his tuft of hair. His heart is his sacrificial post. His desire is his clarified butter. His anger is his animal to be immolated. His austerity is his fire, his sense control is his immolator, his gifts are his daki, his speech is his hotri priest. His breath is his uddhri priest. His sight is his abhayu priest, his mind is his brahman priest, his hearing is his agni priest, the span of his life is his preparatory rite, what he eats. That is his oblation. What he drinks that is his drinking of soma juice, when he delights himself that is his upasad rite. When he walks, sits and stands that is his pravagya right. That which is his mouth that is his havanya fire, that which is his utterance that is his offering of oblation, that which is his knowledge that is his homa sacrifices, when he eats in the afternoon and forenoon that is his samidhoma, oblation of fuel in the fire. The three divisions of the day, forenoon, midday and evening, relating to him are his savanas, the day and night are his the rapramsa sacrifices, the half months and the months are his terms ya sacrifice, 
the seasons are his Pasubandha sacrifice. The Samvaksaras and the Parivaksaras are his Ahuga sacrifice. The total sacrifice is, indeed, his Satara. Death is the Avrita or completion of his sacrifice. That person who knows this, namely, the conduct of a Sarnasin, covering all the duties from Agnihokra to Satara and terminating in death overcome by old age, and who dies during the period of the sun's movement to the north attains to the overlordship of gods like Indra and then reaches identity or companionship with the sun. On the other hand he who dies during the period when the sun moves to the south gets only the greatness of the mains and then attains to the identity or companionship with the moon. A Brahma who knows separately the greatness of the sun and the moon realizes these two. But he who has become a knower of Yayagava wins further. From that knowledge which was acquired in the world of Yayagava, he attains to the greatness of Brahman, the Supreme who is existence knowledgeless, at the dissolution of the world of Yayagava. Thus the secret knowledge I am expressing, say Yogi Rupnathji. Yogi Rupnathji then said, O oh my friends, even as empty, inert nothingness is known as space. Mind is empty nothingness. Whether the mind is real or unreal. It is that which is apprehended in objects of perception. Thought is mind, there is no distinction between the two. The self that is clothed in the spiritual body is known as mind, it is that which brings the material or physical body into existence. Ignorance, samsara, repetitive history. Mind stuff. Bondage, impurity. Darkness and inertia are all synonyms. Experience alone is the mind. It is none other than the perceived. This entire universe is forever non-different from the consciousness that dwells in every atom, even as an ornament is non-different from gold. Just as an ornament potentially exists in gold. The object exists in the subject. But when this notion of the object is firmly rejected and removed from the subject, then consciousness alone exists without even an apparent or potential objectivity. When this is realized, evils like attraction and repulsion, love and hate, cease in one's heart, as also the false notions of the world, you, I etc. Even the tendency to objectify ceases. This is freedom. Yet, we see that there are holy ones who have overcome this external objects like space, etc. And psychological factors like, L, etc. exist only in name. In reality neither the objective universe, nor the perceiving self, nor perception as such, nor void, nor inertness exists, only one is cosmic consciousness, situation. In this it is the mind that conjures up the diversity, diverse actions and experiences. The notion of bondage and the desire for liberation. After the dissolution and before the next approach dawned, the entire objective universe was in a state of equilibrium. There then existed the Supreme Lord, the Eternal, Unborn, Self-Effulgent, who is the All and who is Omnipotent. He is beyond conception and description. Though he is known by various names like Atma etc. These are viewpoints and not the truth. He is. Yet he is not realized by the world. He is within the body, too, yet he is far. From him emerge countless divinities like Lord even as rays emerge from the sun. From him emerge infinite worlds as ripples arise from the surface of the ocean. He is the cosmic intelligence into which countless objects of enter. He is the light in which the self and the world shine. He ordains the characteristic nature of every created thing. In him the worlds appear and disappear, even as a mirage appears and disappears repeatedly. His form, the world, vanishes, but his self is unchanging. He dwells in all. He is hidden and he overflows. By his mere presence this apparently inert material world and its inhabitants are ever active. Because of his omnipresent omnipotent omniscience, his very thoughts materialize. This supreme self cannot be realized, O oh dears, by means other than wisdom not indeed by exerting oneself in religious practices. This self is neither far nor near. It is not inaccessible nor is it in distant places, it is what in oneself appears to be the experience of bliss, and is therefore realized in oneself. Austerity and penance, 
charity and the observances of religious woes do not lead to the realization of the Lord. Only the company of holy men and the study of true scriptures are helpful. As they ignorance and delusion. Even when one is convinced that this self alone is real, one goes beyond sorrow, on the path of liberation. Austerity or is self-inflicted pain. Of what value is charity performed with wealth and by deceiving others? Only they derive the fruits of such charity. Religious observances add to one's vanity. There is only one remedy for ignorance of the Lord, the firm and decisive renunciation of craving for sense pleasure. About the unique absolute soul, Yogi Rupnathji says, he who has been described as the Lord is not very far. He is the intelligence dwelling in the body. He is the universe, though the universe is not he. He is pure intelligence. Ah, one who knows that pure intelligence is the objective universe knows nothing. Sentient is the universe, and sentient is the soul, Jiva. The sentient creates the knowable and gets involved in sorrow. When there is cessation of the knowable, and the flow of attention is towards that which is not knowable, pure intelligence, then there is fulfillment and one beyond sorrow. Without the cessation of the knowable, one's attention cannot be finally turned away from the knowable. Mere awareness of the involvement of the jiva in this sarisara is of no use. But, if the Supreme Lord is known, this sorrow to an end. The cosmic intelligence in which the universe, as it were, ceases to be, is the Lord. In him the relationship appears to have ceased, as such. He is the void in which the universe appears to exist. In him even cosmic consciousness stands still like a mountain. The Lord can be realized only if one is firmly established in the unreality of the universe even as the blueness of the sky is unreal. Dualism presumes says unity, and non-dualism suggests dualism. Only when the creation is known to be utterly non-existent the Lord is realized. The wrong notion that this world is real has become deep wrecks dead on account of persistent wrong thinking. However, it can be removed that very day on which you resort to the company of holy men and to the study of the holy dialogues. When the wrong notion is dispelled and the truth realized, that realization so thoroughly saturates one, that one thinks of it, speaks of it, rejoices in it and teaches it to others. Such people are sometimes called Jivanmukta and also Videha Mukta. He who, while living an apparently normal life, experiences the whole world as an emptiness, is a Jivan Mukta. He is awake but enjoys the calmness of deep sleep. He is unaffected in the least by pleasure and pain. He is awake in deep but he is never awake to this world. His wisdom is unclouded by latent tendencies. He appears to be subject to likes, dislikes and fear. But in fact he is as free as the space. He is free from egotism and volition. And his intelligence is unattached whether in action or in inaction. None is afraid of him, he is afraid of none. He becomes a Vidahamukta when, in due time, the body is dropped. The Vidahamukta is, yet is not. Is not, I, nor the other. He is the sun that shines. Vishnu that protects all, Rudra that destroys all, Brahma that creates. He is space. The earth, water and fire. He is in fact cosmic consciousness. That which is the very essence in all beings. All that which is in the past, present and future. All indeed is he and he alone. Yogi Rupnathji says, what is known as liberation, O oh my dears, is indeed the absolute itself, which alone is. That which is here as you etc. Only seems to be, for it has never been created. How can we say that that Brahman has become all these worlds? O oh friends. In ornaments I see only gold, in waves I see only water, in air I see only movement, in space I see only emptiness, in mirage I see only heat, and not else. Similarly, I see only Brahman the Absolute. Not the worlds. The perception of the worlds is beginningless ignorance. Yet it will vanish with the help of enquiry into truth. Only that ceases to be which has come into being. This world has newer really come into being, yet it appears to be. The exposition of this truth is contained in this chapter on creation.
when the previous cosmic dissolution took place, all that appeared to be before disappeared. Then the infinite alone remained. It was neither emptiness nor a form, neither sight nor the scene, and one could not say that it was. Nor that it was not. It has no ears, no eyes, no tongue, and yet it hears, sees and eats. It is uncaused and uncreated. And it is the cause of everything as water is the cause of waves. This infinite and eternal light is the heart of all. And in its light the three worlds shine, as a mirage. When the infinite vibrates, the worlds appear to emerge. When it does not vibrate, the worlds appear to submerge, even as when a firebrand is whirled fast a fiery circle appears, and when it is held steady, the circle vanishes. Vibrating or not vibrating. It is the same everywhere at all times. Not realizing it, one is subject to delusion. When it is realized all cravings and anxieties vanish. From it is time. From it is perception of the perceivable object. Action, form. Taste, smell, sound, touch and thinking. All that you know is it alone. And it is that by which you know all this. It is in the seer. Sight and seen as the very seeing. When you know it, you realize yourself. Yet, I shall elucidate the correct meaning. Even as the uncarved image is forever present in a block, the world whether you regard it as real or unreal is inherent in the absolute, which is therefore not void. Just as one cannot say that there are no waves present in a calm the absolute is not empty of the world. Of course, these illustrations have limited application and should not be exceeded. In truth, however, this world not arise from the absolute nor does it merge in it. The absolute alone exists now and forever. When one thinks of it as a void, it is because of the feeling one has that it is not void. When one thinks of JT as not void, it is because there is a feeling that it is void. The absolute is immaterial and so material sources of light like the sun, do not illumine it. But it is self-luminous, and therefore it is not inert or dark. This absolute cannot be realized or experienced by another. Only the absolute can realize itself. The infinite, space of, consciousness is even purer than infinite space. And the world is even as that infinite is. But, one who has not tasted capsicum does not know its taste. Even so, one does not experience consciousness in the infinite in the absence of objectivity. Hence, even this consciousness appears to be inert or insentient. And the world is experienced as such too. Even as intangible ocean tangible waves are seen, in the formless Brahman the world also exists without form. From the infinite the infinite emerges and exists in it as the infinite. Hence the world has never really been created. It is the same as that from which it emerges. When the notion of self is destroyed by the withdrawal of the fuel of ideas from the mind. That which is, is the infinite. That which is not sleep nor inert, is the infinite. It is on account of the infinite that knowledge, knower and known exist as one, in the absence of the intellect. Yogi Rupnathji says, from where does the son of a barren woman come? And where does he go? A barren woman's son has no existence. Ever. Even so. This world as such has no existence, ever. This analogy baffles you only because you have taken the of the world for granted. Consider this, is there a bracelet-ness in the golden bracelet? Is it not just gold? Is there a thing called sky independent of the emptiness? Even so. There is no thing called the world independent of Brahman the Absolute. Just as coldness is inseparable from ice, what is called the world is inseparable from Brahman. Water in the mirage does not come into being and go out of existence. Even so this world does not come out of the Absolute nor does it go anywhere. The creation of the world has no cause, and therefore it has had no it not exist even now. How can it reach destruction? If you concede that the world has not been created out of Brahman but assert that it is an appearance based on the reality of Brahman, then indeed it does not exist and Brahman alone exists. It is like a dream, in a state of ignorance the intelligence within oneself appears as numerous dream objects, 
all of which are nothing other than that intelligence. Even so, in what is known as the beginning of creation, such an appearance happened. But it is not independent of Brahman. It does not exist apart from Brahman. Hence it does not exist. Yogi Rupnathji then says, you will then realize the non-existence of creation and lead an enlightened life in this world. O oh my friends, I shall narrate to you how this creation to have emerged from the one pure undivided cosmic being, even as dreams appear in the consciousness of the sleeping person. This universe is in fact the eternal effulgent infinite consciousness which generates within itself the knowable, which would be known as that which is to be, with an idea concerning its form, which is space, and with an enquiry concerning itself. Thus is space brought into being. When, after a considerable time the consciousness of creation becomes strong in the infinite being, the future jiva, living cosmic soul also known as Hipayagava, arises within it, and the infinite abandons, as it were, its supreme state, to limit itself as the jiva. However, even then Brahman remains the infinite, and there is no real transformation into any of these. In space, the faculty of sound manifests itself. Then comes into being egotism which is vital to further creation of the universe, and, at the same time, the factor known as time. All this happens merely by the creative thought inherent in the cosmic being, not as real transformations of the infinite. By the similar exercise of the creative thought, air is created. Consciousness which is surrounded by all these is called the jiva which gives rise to all the different elements in this world. There are 14 planes of existence, each with its own type of inhabitants. And all these are the manifestations of the creative thought of simsiousness. Even so, when this consciousness thought, L am light, sources of light like the sun, etc., were instantly created. Similarly water and earth were created. All these fundamental elements continued to act upon one another a sensor and experience. And the entire creation comes into being like ripples on the surface of the ocean. And, they are interwoven and mixed up so effectively that they cannot be extricated from one another till the cosmic dissolution. These material appearances are ever changing and the reality exists unchanged. Since these are all linked with consciousness, they instantly become gross physical substance, though all these are the infinite consciousness alone, which has undergone no change whatsoever. The five elements are the of which the world is the and the eternal consciousness is the for the elements. As is the seed, so is the fruit therefore, the world is nothing but Brahman the Absolute. Friends, I shall now tell you how the Jiva, living soul, came to dwell in this body. The Jiva thought. I am atomic in nature and stature. And so it became atomic in nature. Yet. It only apparently became so. On account of its imagination which was false. Even as one may dream that he is dead and that he has another body. This jiva which in truth had an extremely subtle body of pure consciousness. Now begins to identify itself with grossness and so becomes gross. Even as a mountain is reflected in a mirror and is seen as if it were in the mirror. The jiva reflects the external objects and activities. And soon begins to think that they are all within itself and that he is the doer of the actions and the experiencer of experiences. When the jiva wishes to see. Eyes are formed in the gross body. Even so the skin, tactile sense. Ears, tongue, nose and the organs of action are formed as a result of the appropriate desire arising in the jiva. Thus in the body abides the jiva which has the extremely subtle body of consciousness. Imagining various external physical experiences and various internal psychological experiences. Thus resting in the unreal which however appears to be real, Brahman, now appearing to be Jiva, becomes confused. This same Brahman which has come to regard itself as a finite Jiva and endowed with a physical body. Apprehends the external world which on account of the veil of ignorance appears to be composed of matter. Someone thinks he is Brahma, in this manner the Jiva imagines it is someone else thinks he is something else this or that. And so binds itself to the illusion of world appearance. Friends, there is neither one Jiva nor many nor a conglomerate of Jiva. Jiva is only a name. 
what exists is only Brahman. Because he is omnipotent. His thought forms materialize. One alone appears as diverse on account of ignorance. We do not experience this ignorance which disappears on enquiry even as darkness vanishes when light is brought in to look at it. Brahman alone is the cosmic, Mahajiva, soul and the millions of Jiva. There is not else. But all this is mere imagination or thought. Even now nothing has ever been created. The pure infinite space alone exists. Brahma the creator could not create the world as it was before the cosmic dissolution, for Brahma attained final liberation then. Cosmic consciousness alone exists now and ever. In it are no worlds. No created beings. That consciousness reflected in itself appears to be creation. Even as an unreal nightmare produces real results, this world seems to give rise to a sense of reality in a state of ignorance. When true wisdom arises, this unreality vanishes. By the apprehension of the perceived or the knowable, it comes Jiva, the living soul, and is apparently involved in repetitive history, samsara. When the false notion of a knowable apart from the knower, consciousness, it regains its the mysterious power of consciousness which in an inexplicable and miraculous way produces this infinite diversity of names and forms, body, is known as egotism. When egotism has come into being, that egotism, which is non-different from consciousness, entertains notions of the various elements that constitute this universe. And they arise. In unity diversity arises. Friends, give up all these false notions of L, my and you, by renouncing even the notions of a jiva and its own kois. When all these have gone, you will realize the truth which is in the middle between the real and the unreal. This consciousness is not knowable, when it wishes to become the knowable it is known as the universe. Mind. Intellect. Egotism. The five great elements, and the world. All these innumerable names and forms are all consciousness alone. A man and his life and works are indistinguishable, the static and the kinetic manifestations of the same factor. Jiva and the mind etc. are all vibrations in consciousness. This is the truth. People like to argue and confuse others. They are indeed confused. But, oh my dear friends. We are beyond confusion. Changes in the unchanging are imagined by ignorant and deluded people. But in the vision of sages who have self-knowledge no change whatsoever has taken place in consciousness. When the notion of an external knowable has been removed, self-knowledge arises. And when in it there is the notion of inertia or ignorance, the state of deep sleep has come to it. Hence, since consciousness alone exists at all times, it may be said that space exists and does not exist, the world exists and not exist. Even as heat is to fire, whiteness is to a conch shell. Firmness is to a mountain, liquidity is to water, butter is to milk, water is to ice, brightness is to illumination, all is to mustard seed. Flow is to a river, sweetness is to honey, ornament is to gold, aroma is to a fleur. The universe is to consciousness. The world exists because consciousness is, and the world is the bhakti of consciousness. There is no division, no difference, no distinction. Hence the universe can be said to be both real and unreal. Real because of the reality of consciousness which is its own reality, and unreal because the universe does not exist as universe, independent of consciousness. But, because of the unreality of the universe, etc. It cannot be said that its own cause, namely, the consciousness, is also unreal, such a statement would only be a set of words with no meaning. For it runs to our experience, and the existence of consciousness cannot be denied. At this stage the third evening set in, and the assembly dispersed. O oh friends! Even as from the waking state experience, there is no materiality in the objects seen in a dream, though while dreaming the objects appear to be solid, this world appears to be material yet in reality it is pure consciousness. There is not even a temporary or subtle river in the mirage, even so there is in no sense a real world. But only pure consciousness. 
Only knowledge based on ignorance clings to the notion of a world. Says Yogi Rupnathji, in reality, there is no difference in the meaning of the words. World. Brahman or the infinite. And self. The world is as true in relation to Brahman as the dream city is true in relation to the experience of the waking consciousness. Hence. World and cosmic consciousness are synonyms. Soul, the Brahman, the glorious Lord. The stage called Nirvoya. The place called Siddhapada where yogi or yoginis attained the liberation became famous as the holiest place in the three worlds. His or her mortal body from which impurities are eliminated by yoga, is transformed into a river, a prominent one among many rivers. It blesses one with Siddhas and is resorted to by Siddhas. He who listens to this doctrine of the sages regarding the knowledge about the Atman, becomes able to concentrate his mind upon the venerable Lord whose banner has the of Garuda, and he attains to the lotus-like feet of the glorious Lord. Thus the secret knowledge here, and in this lecture, is concluded. Said Yogi Rupnathji. Even if those who are born as human beings do not care about the study of the Vedas as well as the inanimate sciences, those inanimate objects only carry the burden of falsehood. If they have to endure so much grief pain and disability with a single stupid body, they themselves do not know why they are carrying so many stupid bodies in vain, says Yogi Rupnathji, when he is addressing all the world community. Yogi Rupnathji said, in Bhagavad Gita, the Almighty Lord Krishna declared that, Devote your heart, mind, religious sacrifices and prayers to me for eternity O path, and you shall, without fail, become a part of me forever. This is my promise to you, my devotee. Detach yourself from all worldly things O Arjuna, and reach out to me for your salvation and liberation from this world. I shall always protect you from all the worldly sins you may encounter. Put your full love, trust, and devotion in me and you shall fear nothing. I think these sacred dialogues will be very enlightening and preaches the supreme knowledge of Advak. Yogi Rupnathji explains the meaning of Atma, Self, from Puranas. Atma is that which pervades, the universe, takes back, the universe at the time of dissolution, enjoys, as the illuminator or experiencer of, objects here, in the world, and has eternal existence. Yogi Rupnathji say, according to me, the spiritual yoga is the only means of attaining the supreme good for all mankind where there is a total cessation of both sorrow and joy. I shall expound to you that yoga, with all its aspects, which was earlier taught to rishis who were eager to listen. It is considered by me that it is the mind, indeed, that is the cause for bondage and liberation of the self. For spiritual seekers, for attaining the reality, there is no path as auspicious as devotion, which unites one to the Lord who is the self of all beings. Extreme attachment, to the world, is an unbreakable rope for the self. Say learned men. The same when done for noble men, opens the gateway to liberation. Peaceful men of forbearance and compassion, without enemies, and the well-wishers of all beings, are the best among all noble people. Various worldly afflictions do not trouble those who practice firm devotion in me, with an unwavering mind, having given up all actions, relations, and friends for my sake, who depend on me alone who listen and tell my sweet stories, and whose mind is absorbed in me. You should seek the company of those noble souls who are free of all attachments as they remove all your worldly attachments. Devotion is the single-pointed natural flow of thoughts along with senses by the gunas and actions understood by the scriptures, towards the Lord who is purity itself. It is costless, pertaining to the Lord, superior to all siddhis and destroys the covering of ignorance just as fire swallows all that is put in it. Devotion reveled. Some devotees do not desire to become one with me. They revel in serving my feet and doing activities for me. They assemble together and enjoy my work. Advak devotees never perish. Those for whom I am the supreme beloved, the self, son, friend, guru, well-wisher, and dear lord, Ayesta Deva, and who meditate on my peaceful form, never perish as unwinking time has no power over them. Jiva is renounced. I take such devotees across death who, having renounced all others, 
This world, the other world, the jivahood that goes from this world to the other, the body, and all that relates to it like prosperity, animals, and houses, worship me alone of universal form with single-pointed devotion. I shall now explicitly expound to you the differentiating characteristics of various entities, knowing which man becomes free of various entities, knowing which a man becomes free from the qualities of Prakriti. I shall describe to you that knowledge about which great sages speak, which is the means to the supreme good of man, which gives self-knowledge and cuts the knots of the heart. Purusa was attributeless before creation. Before creation, the Purusa was the beginningless self, attributeless, beyond Prakriti, the very subject and self-shining, and even now it alone pervades the world. Purusa manifested as Prakriti. Brahman getting deluded. The same infinite Lord, by chance alone, in sport, became manifested as the subtle Prakriti with qualities. Prakriti with its qualities creates a variety of being like itself. The Lord or Self having seen the creation got, as it were, completely deluded through the wailing of knowledge. Thus, by brooding over the other, Prakriti, man assumes doership of actions that are actually done by the qualities of Prakriti. About cause of bondage of sansara, Yogi Rupnathji says, that doership causes bondage of samsara and enslaves this non-doer, witness, and peaceful self, the Lord. The great sages know that Prakriti is the cause of the cause-effect relationship and the notion of doership, and Purusa which is beyond Prakriti is the cause of the enjoyment of joy and sorrow. Purusa does not get affected by Prakriti. The Purusa, even though dwelling in Prakriti, does not get affected by the qualities of Prakriti, as he is immutable, non-doer, and attributeless like the sun in water. When the Purusa gets overwhelmingly attached to the qualities of Prakriti and gets deluded by the notion of doing, he then considers, I am the doer. Because of this attachment and doership, he helplessly reaches the state of a samsari and becomes unhappy. Due to the evil of action born of attachment, he is born in good, bad and middling wombs. Objects do not exist in reality because. Indeed, even though objects do not exist really, the samsara does not seem to end. Just as one who broads on objects meets with disaster alone, even in the dream. Therefore, the mind which is extremely attached to rowing ways should be slowly brought under control by intense practice of devotion and dispassion. The bondage of Purusa by Prakriti is burnt up by spiritual practices performed day and night by Prakriti, body-mind, itself, like the fuel by the fire in the cup of the Arani. The practices are costless, choiceless, performance of one's duties, purity of mind, intense devotion to me, nourished by constant listening, knowledge with clear vision of truth, straw in dispassion, intense meditation accompanied by austerity, and absorption of the mind. Jiva does not get deluded when that Prakriti which has been completely enjoyed, then discarded, whose evil effects are seen constantly, can cause no harm to one who abides in the glory of one's own self. The this statement is explained further with the help of example. Just as a dream causes a lot of sorrow to one who has not awakened, but the same does not delude one who has woken up. A person when asleep dreams and takes a role where he enjoys, suffers but on awakening, he realizes that everything was illusion and not a reality. Further Yogi Rupnathji says, in the same way, Prakriti never harms him who knows the truth and who revels in the self, as his mind is always united with me. Earlier, it was said that Purusa was formless and attributeless, without qualities, prior to creation. Our journey too is to go back to this state where there is no one else other than self. O oh friends, when the mind of the accomplished one does not get attached to the powers gained by the intense practice of yoga, for which, powers, there is no other cause, then one gains my absolute state where there is no laughter of death. This knowledge should not be taught to the wicked, the arrogant, the stubborn, the one with bad conduct, a hypocrite, an indulgent one one whose mind is obsessed with home, one who is not devoted to me and also one who dislikes my or absolute soul devotees. This knowledge should be given to one with faith, devotion, humility, who is uncarping, a friend of all, revels in serving all, 
dispassionate, peaceful, free of envy, pure, and to whom I am the dearest of all. O my loving friends, by abiding in this easy to practice path, revealed by me to you, you shall alone reach the supreme goal. Have faith in this teaching of mine which is worshipped by the seekers or knowers of Brahmavidya. You shall reach my unborn state by it. Those who do not know it reach death. Due to the elimination of Jivahood, and the mind firmly abiding in its reality, the Lord, who is the support of all Jivas, her allegations were destroyed and she attained total peace. As her mind remained absorbed in the truth, she transcended the delusion of the qualities of Prakriti and, at that time, did not even remember her body like the one who awakes, does not remember, objects seen in the dream. Yogis are not aware of her physical body. That body, nourished by others was not even emaciated due to absence of mental afflictions. It is covered with dirt like fire with smoke. His mind absorbed in Vasudeva, Yogi, is totally unaware of his or her own body which was transformed by austerity and yoga, and protected by God, he or she seat with hair open, unconscious even of her clothes. Yogi Rupnathji says, O my friends, when the mind of the Siddha, the emancipated sage, is not attached to the miraculous powers born of yoga and obtained through yogi practice, then only is attained the ultimate state pertaining to me, a state where even the they cannot laugh. Is powerless. O oh friends, I shall explain to you the nature of the Sabhijya type of yoga, by practicing which only, the mind becomes tranquil and pure, and goes to the path, leading, to Brahmana. Performance of one's religious duties according to one's capacity, aversion to a religion, contentment in what one obtains by the Lord's grace, or one's fate. Worshipping the feet of those who have realized the soul, Atman. Abstention from duties pertaining to them, earth and the first three common goals in life, devoted to duties leading to moke, liberation, eating pure food in moderation and permanent stay in a safe, secluded place. Non-violence, truthfulness, non-stealing, acceptance of only the bare necessities of life, celibacy, penance, purity, study of Vedas or Sastras, ritualistic worship of the Supreme Man. Silence, ever firmness in bodily posture and steady nag, gradual control of breath, mental withdrawal of sense from their objects into the heart. Concentration of the mind and the breath in one of the plexuses, like the Muladhara Kakra, constant meditation of the Leelas, sports, actions, of Lord, and concentration of the mind on God. By these and other means, such as observance of woes, giving donations, one should attain control over his breath, and deliberately and without slackness, direct the mind to the right path, mind which has become polluted by going to the path of worldly enjoyment. Having firmly fixed his seat in a clean holy place, he should, firstly, get, thorough, control of his posture. He should comfortably 81 I be seated on that seat, and keeping his body erect, he should practice, breath control. He should purify the passage, path, of the breath, the respiratory system, by systematic inhalation, retention and exhalation of breath or vice versa so that the mind becomes quiescent and steady. The mind of a yogin who has mastered his breathing, becomes pure immediately just as gold melt by the blast of wind and fire, gives up the dross mixed with it, one should burn one's impure humids in the body by the sins by the attachment objects of senses by prayura and undivine quality by meditation. When one's mind become pure and properly steady this is practically by Tayaga, one should meditate on the form of the Suprakme Lord, with his eyes fixed at the farthest end of his nose. Yogi Rupnathji says, O oh my friends, the yogin should meditate on the complete form of God, till his mind is completely fired on God whose lotus-like face is kindly, that is gracious, whose eyes are reddish like the interior of a lotus, whose is dark blue like the petals of a blue lotus, who is holding, in his hands, a conch, a disc, sudhasana chakra, and a make, komoki gada, whose silk garments are yellow like the bright, shining, filaments of a lotus, whose chest bears the mark of Srivaksa who wears the resplendent jewel hostuva around his neck, 
who is by a vanama about which intoxicated bees are humming sweetly, who is adorned with invaluable necklace, bracelets, crown, armlets, aigda, and anklets, whose waist, lit hip, is engirded by a lustrous belt, whose eat is in the lotus-like hero of his devotees, who is the most beautiful, serene, delighting the eyes and caminds of ice devotees, who is charming to look, who is bold, and by all the worlds who appears like a boy of fifteen, in age who is eagerly absorbed in, shovering, grace on his servants whose holy fame to be equalized who has enhanced the fame of Bali and other lokas, persons of hallowed name. With his mind full of pure devotion, he should contemplate the God as standing, walking, sitting, lying, or occupying his heart, Lord who it us are worth looking. When the sage finds that his mind conciated on all the members of the of the Lord as a whole, he should try to fix on the malbas of the body of the Lord, one by one. He should reflect, contate, the feet of the Lord which are enriched by the lines showing, marv of 